Query and Company. I'm going to be keeping you company for the next few hours. You are not going to believe the company. This company. You're going to bankrupt your mama's company. At least I have the radio to keep me company. On 93.5 and 107.5, The Fan. Man, there's a ton to talk about, gentlemen. We got a ton to talk about today. It's beautiful outside. Listen, I, I probably am going to start every day for the next three weeks this way, okay? But I can't be alone in this. I cannot be alone in this. When you live in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I'm not talking about if you grow up in San Francisco. I'm not talking about if you grow up in Miami or Houston, or Phoenix, even Nashville. If you grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana, you know, Kurt Vonnegut once said that living in Indianapolis was miniature golf 364 days a year and the Indianapolis 500 on the 365th. But that was really before the NCAA tournament was a big-time thing. I think the NCAA tournament, obviously it's been around since 1939, but it was in 1979 where it really took hold of the American culture, largely due to, as is well documented, the Michigan State-Indiana State final in Salt Lake. But March Madness and all of that, when you live in Indianapolis, there's a magic to it because it reawakens in you the magic of kind of like Christmas morning, but waking up and realizing that the doldrums of the gray snow and cold days are largely behind you. Now, it's not to say that we're not going to have probably another snowstorm here coming up or something, you know, the temperature is going to plummet at some point, but you know, you're kind of out of the woods and today's like the perfect day for it. Roll down the windows a little bit, sunny outside, turn up the radio. Not until six, do you listen to anything other than sports talk um, or seven? But there's so much going on that you it, it just it re it like reinvigorates you right like let's go let's go like here we are and it's this it's also this cross mesh of different sports that are taking place. Well, and it's the perfect baton toss, right? Because you get to March Madness, and I don't want to skip over You're that exactly because correct. it's in my heart. But then after that's done, we're at Augusta National. And it's the Masters. And even if you're not a golf fan, like I've seen people talk to people my age, same thing when they were in college. I'm sure college kids still do it. Nothing like if you're at IU or Purdue, rolling up the windows of the dorm and just turning on some golf in the background, even if you're not like a diehard golf fan, because it's kind of the official Easter time. Yeah, I mean, the sports calendar starts to accelerate. And then you blink and we're in the month of May, right? right? Like it's it's a full fast track, pardon the pun, between now March Madness all the way to the Masters in between, then Indianapolis 500. But there is still stuff beyond the NCAA tournament going on right now and circling briskly. Like today, supposedly, I I didn't hear it, but I guess they were testing all of the like storm sirens and stuff. They could be going off in the NFL as well because it is an absolute carousel, both of player movement and rumors flying. Stephen Holder going to join us at 1 o'clock, and there's a lot to talk about with them, including players that are leaving the Colts, players that are retained by the Colts, players that could be coming to the Colts. There is a part of me that is cynical about this, and we'll begin here. I oftentimes use the analogy of the LeBron James sweepstakes of the summer free agency and the decision, and everyone and their brother Two years prior to that was like, you know, um, I actually heard, I've got a friend who's next door neighbors, the mailman for the next door neighbor's girlfriend of the GM for the Suns, and they're clearing cap space because LeBron James is going to be a free agent. It's funny you say that because I talked to some guy in New York who knows a secretary to James Dolan, and they're actually moving rosters around to be able to wave a couple contracts here and there to be in on the sweepstakes. It's crazy. Correct, right? Yeah. Everybody, but everybody thought they were the only ones thinking it. The same holds true right now for teams that think that they're going to acquire Justin Fields. And the latest is, you know, there have been made lists of best landing spots for Justin Fields. And there is discussion or speculation that Indianapolis could be on that list. Now, 
How likely is that? I would say probably not a lot because you're going to have to give up a lot to get him, one would think. I mean, Chicago's not just going to give him away because they have the first pick. But secondly, there are still franchises, I would assume, that would be interested in having him as a starter. And so if you are interested in having Justin Fields as a starter, you are going to give up more for him than a franchise that is going to trade for him to make him a backup. Now, the one advantage, and I'm speaking strictly in hypotheticals here, the one advantage to Justin Fields being a backup for the Colts would be the following, and that is he plays a similar style of play as Anthony Richardson. And by that, I mean mobile guy, deep ball threat, can extend plays. It is less like drop back level than, say, Gardner Minshew. And so you don't have to – when Minshew was in, you're probably running different you're, – you're running the same personnel but different schemes than when Anthony Richardson was out there. So it allows for a more seamless transition and continuity of flow offensively when you have a backup quarterback that plays a similar kind of style or presents the similar kind of challenges to a defense as Justin Fields would as Anthony Richardson. I don't personally think that that's on the front burner, but it makes certainly for good fodder, and it would make sense, but it also would make sense for, as I mentioned, me to just go ahead and, and, you know, go out and buy a nice – used I'm not saying that Justin Fields is a Rolex but he used to sew uh, yeah okay but I mean that doesn't mean that I'm just that I just oh well I just have the money laying around to do that I there's everything comes at a cost and I would think that Justin Fields would come at a cost that is more than what the payoff would be by having him as your backup and the, the question also is how many people still need a starting quarterback well, that's right what now I said as well too that's right, what I like, said, right because that increases the value because right? you saw you saw the Steelers take care of it yesterday You saw the Falcons take care of it yesterday. You saw the Vikings technically take care of it yesterday. Not that you'd likely see an in-division trade like that for a quarterback, even if Justin Fields' future is unknown. Like There's, to your point, Jake, so many spots that filled up just in the first 24 hours of the legal tampering period that now it makes you wonder if the Bears might be content to hold pat with Fields and wait things out. Which, Lee, okay, here's another thing. Let me tell you what there's increased smoke about. I don't believe it. I'll be. I'll go on record of saying I don't believe it. I'm just here as the facilitator of conversation, right? We get a lot of these. I mean, I, I get my number out on the air, so I get a lot of texts, right? Which I'm very, very grateful for. I, I love it. That's why I do it. I mean, I, I love the interaction with people. Th- this should be a sports bar. Th- this is. This should be a sports bar. We're just in here shooting the ball, passing around beer nuts, right? But. In the last couple of days, I've heard more of this, and I I do chalk this up as we're clearing space for LeBron James level conversation. Uh, Jake, I have a very reliable source within the Colts organization. I'm not mimicking that. I mean, that, that's entirely possible. I was told that Ursay has directed Chris Ballard to make a move to get Marvin Harrison Jr. regardless of cost. He knows it'll put fans in the seats and make our offense dangerous with all of the weapons. I can't say this will happen for certain, but the word has come down. And the source has never been wrong for me before. Now, I will simply say this. Marvin Harrison Jr. is – I do think that Jim Irsay is a nostalgic guy. I, I think that they're probably – I think Jim Irsay would love to have Marvin Harrison Jr. But I, I don't – The cost is impossible. The cost is really high. And here's the other thing, Jimmy. Jim Mersey made a comment, a flippant comment the other day about getting Marvin Harrison Jr. Do I think that he would like to have him? I do. And do I think that there are times where Jim Mersey arm wrestles a little bit and, and doesn't direct things to happen but strongly implies that it would be a good idea? I do. Could I see that that, that conversation has taken place? I can. But talking about it and executing it are two totally different things. And – Sure, there are uh, there are dominoes that have to fall in so many different places. Not saying it can't happen, but because of the fact that there are teams, you're running a, to get him. You would have to to at the very least drafts. 
you know, you're running a risk that somebody is going to smoke screen and act like they're taking a quarterback and they go ahead and take him. Can you imagine if the Colts, for example, traded a King's ransom <laughs> to move up to number three? Or for that matter, can you imagine if the if the Chicago Bears don't move Justin Fields and the Colts give up a King's ransom to go to second? convinced that the Bears are going to take Caleb Williams, and then the Bears shock the world to take Marvin Harrison Jr. Well, the way to undercut that and play it safe, and this might not be something that Colts fans want to hear if we're entertaining this rumor mill, that's a draft day trade. And not only is it a draft day trade, it is a the Arizona Cardinals are now on the clock trade. Right. You cannot run the risk of that happening. You're right. I, again, I, I would put the po- – is it possible? Sure. Is it probable? Probably not. But let's get to what happened – in terms of the last 24 hours or so. You have Zach Moss. I personally think this is actually more significant than it is given credit. Zach Moss has signed with Cincinnati. Cincinnati originally was going to just release Joe Mixon. They are now trading Joe Mixon to Houston. So Joe Mixon, good player. I think Zach Moss is a better player than he was given credit. And is the backup running back position a a position that is easily replaced in terms of roster space and personnel. It is. Yeah. But that is not to say that you get a guy that plays at the same level of effectiveness as would what you got out of Zach Moss. Like they could get a rookie. I mean, you know, you can replace him pretty inexpensively, but I thought Zach Moss when his number was called last year was really good and actually won a few games for the Colts. Now, I won't argue with you on that, Jacob. There's no doubt he was invaluable when he was there. But I feel like a prototypical Zach Moss, because of the cost, you can afford to bring in two of those candidates, whether it's to the draft or through free agency. And if you're wrong on one but right on the other, you can just eat the cost and it's fine. Like that, it, The cost to go and get another Zach Moss is not one that is unobtainable in this league. Like I, I, I agree with you. He did all the right things and excelled in all the right areas, but that's not irrepla- irreplaceable for where the Colts are at, especially right. in this league. Now, Tyquan Lewis, they brought back. I liked that. Tyquan Lewis is a guy that I think, you know, two-year, $12 million, I, I mean, it's crazy to say that that's, you know, just like nothing money, but I think Tyquan Lewis is a guy that has shown just enough, Jimmy, that that's actually kind of a value because if he stays healthy and can give you some contribution – it's contribution that probably is above a six million dollar pay grade, right? Yeah, I mean he he's versatile as a defensive lineman, and the cost that you're having to pay to get him and what he's been able to show in his time with the Colts the last couple of off seasons when they've had to do this and rework with him or bring him back in, yeah, it's a win ultimately to be able to secure his services another year. Gardner Minshew is now in Las Vegas. Not a huge loss, obviously. Let me rephrase that. Assuming Anthony Richardson is back and is healthy, and by the way, Anthony Richardson yesterday swinging a golf club at top at uh, Top Golf. Now, if you're coming off, sh- I don't, I have no idea. Is that the, that's not snowboarding equivalent, is it? Is that a good sign? Is that news? Do I need to break that? I don't think it's, I don't think it's breaking news. I would send video of Anthony Richardson swinging a golf club at Top Golf. I would chalk that up as a W. I think that means your rehab is good. I would think, right? Yeah. There, there can't be anything in his contract, right? Like if you're coming off of shoulder surgery that you're not supposed to swing a golf club? I know it's not. It's kind of in market because he's a former Colt, right? But he's gone away out of market, so you can kind of analyze how much it matters or not. And this is one of those instances where the caveat is important. When we talk about contracts, it is possible to separate the happiness for the player getting the money Versus whether or not it was actually a good deal for the team. Two years, $25 million for Gardner Minshew. And potentially maybe the starter in Las Vegas. Good right. for him. You're he's, right. a, he's achieved what he wanted to achieve. He did. He- that said, the Raiders supposed to be maybe turned a quarter. Antonio Pierce knows what's there. They go get Christian Wilkinson's. They shore up the defense. Wilkins and Crosby up front. That's going to be crazy. But your answer at quarterback is a perennial backup. Donut tire, right? Yeah. Now, good for Minshew, though. Correct. And I thought Minshew, look, that was a win-win. It was a win-win. Not often in sports do we see win-wins. We saw it. The Tyrese Halliburton, Domas Sabonis trade was a win-win. Both teams made out really well in in multiple areas from that trade. Win-win. 
The Gardner Minshew Indianapolis Colts relationship was a win win. He got what he needed out of it. He was able to show that he could play and elevate his profile to the point of getting a starting opportunity at the cost of twelve and a half million a year. And the Colts got somebody that kept them relevant and interesting and gave some of their players an opportunity to see what it's like to push for a playoff spot, fall a little bit short of that, give them incentive moving forward, and presumably and hopefully teach Anthony Richardson a little bit. Not that Anthony Richardson, I'm just saying about professionalism and sure. being in the NFL, right? I mean, he's a young player. It's good to have a veteran like that Correct. to help a rookie quarterback. So it's a win-win yep. for both of them. So good luck to Gardner Minshew. Now, that does leave somewhat of a hole for the Colts at the backup position. Is is Sam Ellinger the guy? Or do they go out and find somebody to say, look, we need to, you know, the same thing. When Peyton Manning was the quarterback here, you know, you, you had Jim Sorge towards the end there, but by and large at the beginning of his career, I mean, there was kind of a rotation of the backups. You had Brock Heward, you had, I think, Jim Druckenmiller at one point, Mark Rippon. I mean, there's, there were, you know, Kelly Holcomb. There were always kind of a series of different names that came through. So that's not unprecedented. But ideally, it's some, you'd like to get somebody that has some experience. But again, I think that their goal may be to get a player that plays a similar style so that you're not altering your playbook and you can start to get that continuity of the style now that you've got Pittman in the mix and you're hoping to get, you know, you want to get Pierce a chance to really see what he can do in the same system. If that's what they want, based on what's left on the free agent market at quarterback, I would almost think they go and they go get somebody late in the draft. Like a like a, another dual threat mobile quarterback, and I, I don't know if that's out there. To be clear, I've not looked at rounds four through seven of the quarterback market in the twenty twenty four NFL draft, but that might be the play if you're looking for that specific answer, which is same style, not having to change too much for Shane Steichen. I mean, Ryan Tannehill, Drew Locke, Terry Bridgewater, Tyler Huntley, Joe Flacco, Brian Hoyer. Like th- that's your, those are your available veterans, and. No disrespect to any of them that are there, but nobody on that page screams mobile. So maybe it's a play where they go and get it in the draft. Neither did Gardner Minshew. Right, but I think Jake's saying get away from that. Get somebody that's more stylistically sound to Anthony Richardson. If if the the goal is to to not do that, then yes, those names become relevant. I'm going to put this in a really weird term, okay? And literally, I've got to be the only person in the history of mankind that is used auto racing to make the NFL more relatable, right? Because like auto racing, like 18% of people like actively follow it and the NFL, 18% of people don't, right? But in auto racing, you have, like, if you look at the IndyCar series, you have two kinds of races. You have an oval where you turn only left and then you have a road or street course where you're turning left and right, okay? Those two cars, the tub is the same. But the wings of the car are different depending on whether you are needing to turn only left or if it's a car that turns left and right. The balance, the weight, the distribution, all of that for the car, it is, they are two literally two totally different cars. Okay? same. You sit in it, it's the same tub, but all the Lego pieces that go around it are different depending on which course you're running on. And in the NFL, at the quarterbacking position, what you want is – if you are a quarterback that is a road and street course quarterback that is able to both run and throw and turn left and right and you are built that way, then when you all of a sudden take the day off but somebody still wants to take the car out for a ride, you want that person to get in the same car, the one that turns left and right and is set up that way. And at the quarterbacking position, I think the Colts now, because they have a quarterback that is a road street course guy that is built to go left and right, pass and throw, they would like to, when he is there, not replace him with a guy that runs only ovals. Correct. And that that guy, that driver, is not, unless I'm missing something, is not present in available free agents. You could go trade for somebody. Tyler Huntley is you available. Could draft Tyler Huntley would be one. His name has been thrown out there. Okay. But here's the thing. Tyrod Taylor just signed. He would have been another Correct. one. Correct. He's off the board. The question I would have is, wouldn't you want someone that's different stylistically? That way you're not putting that backup quarterback in a position where he could also get hurt next thing you know. You have to go to Sam Ellinger as your third option. Well, Ellinger kind of runs that same thing too, though. That's the thing. It's I just think that they feel like it's not at the and I don't think you can operate underneath a life of fear. I get your point, Eddie. I get your point. I mean, do you need to 
Do, do you need to have the backup be somebody that's under a little more bubble wrap? Mm-hmm. Right? I, I get it. I mean, but the reason I would push against that, Jake, is you can't, A, live in life of fear for your backup first. And then secondly, largely speaking, when the backup goes down or when the starter goes down to your spare donut tire analogy, it's over anyway. It's my greatest like you're, analogy you're, of all it's time. It's beautiful. Yeah. You're, but your expectations that you're playing for go from win the South to if it's a season ender for Anthony Richardson, if we're mapping this out, ultimately it doesn't matter. I want to play to Shane Steichen's strengths, and if he wants to do what you're proposing, which is keep the car the same and just put in an identical driver, then, yes, you should look for somebody stylistically so. And even if Tyler Huntley's available, that's one name present on free agency. In all likelihood, if they want that, they're going to have to get it in the draft or go trade for it. Eddie, what was your first sports poster when you were a kid that hang, that hung on your wall in your bedroom? Oh. Um, I mean, it was like five years recall. ago. It can't be that hard to remember. <laughs> I, didn't ha- I, don't, I didn't hang stuff up in my bedroom. I hung stuff up on my door. It was different. Uh, okay. But it was Bronson Arroyo, I believe. Okay. Uh, Jimmy Cook, your first sports poster hanging on the wall was what? The first one that's popping into my head is I had a poster that I got from one of the school book fairs. Yeah, of, the, the very of, common Of answer. Reggie. Okay. Was it one of the Sports Illustrated posters that just had the name at the top and then it was an action photo? Right, but it wasn't like the paper thin from the magazine. It was like a, right. you know, a, no, I know. a hard laminate. But, but those were technically made by Sports Illustrated where the top yes. just had the name, yeah. you know, Walter Payton, and then it was a photo. Yep. I could still remember the Walter Payton one he's bringing through the line. Yep. reason I mention it because last night, Trace Jackson Davis got himself on a poster. He posterized Webb and Yama. Trace Jackson Davis, Golden State, taking on San Antonio, season opening down the lane. Goes over. He kind of went beside Wimamiyama if we're really critiquing yeah, it. Man. But nonetheless, when you dunk over a number one, can't miss seven foot nine inch center that everybody loves from France, you are, my friend, now a poster. And Wimamiyama, to my knowledge, for the first time in his NBA career, was posterized and it came at the hands of former Indiana Mr. Basketball Center Grove and IU star Trace Jackson Davis. Over adjacent. Hell yes, let's go. Over adjacent. That's fine. That's still a W. Doesn't yeah. matter. I mean, it's it's still a poster. It was the sick dunk. Scott Skiles does tell the story about the time when some kid came up and said, Can you sign my poster? And he goes, I don't think I have a poster. And the kid goes, Yeah, you do. And he unfurled it. And it was a poster of Michael Jordan dunking on Scott Skiles. <laughs> and he's like, All right, fine. He signed it. Uh, basketball last night took place here in Indiana. We'll talk about that with a guy that has been at his school longer than anybody coaching in Division One. That's in just under 20 minutes. It's Query and Company on a gorgeous-looking Tuesday. 93.5 and 107.5 The Fan. I'm what you might call very good.
Pacers in Oklahoma City tonight. We'll talk about that a little over the course of the show. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what's taking place at the Indiana Farmers Coliseum coming up in about 15 minutes. Stephen Holder will join us at 1 o'clock. Paul Cassaro. Now, Jimmy, you've got a relationship with Paul Cassaro, right? I do, yes. The uh, Cassaros are a Ron Colley family, uh, family friends. Love love Coach Cassaro. He has had a heck of a year, not just from a coaching standpoint, but from a personal standpoint as well. Yes. In a good way. He has. In a good way. Uh, he is going to join the program as well coming up at 145. But, Eddie, before all of that, when it comes to the world of college basketball and the Big Ten Conference, which is actually now like the Big 20 Conference or whatever it is, but for now it's just, what, 16 teams, 14 teams, 15 teams, nonetheless. They have awards to hand out, and Eddie Garrison, go ahead and uh, hit the sounder. Now, it's a low bar because Al Pacino was going to go ahead and read these off for us, Eddie, but instead we will have you do it. Go ahead. Yeah, Eddie, if you could just for one of these say, my eyes see, and then announce the award, that'd be great. Okay, I'll do it right off the bat then. Right, so, you. my eyes see... <laughs> Uh, Matt Painter is co-coach of the year with co. Fred Hoiberg of Nebraska. Okay, so Fred. Now this is this is according to who? This the is Big which, Ten. So the Big Ten Conference has awarded Fred Hoiberg of Nebraska, the former Indiana Pacer, and Matt Painter of Purdue as the co-coaches of the year. Okay. Additionally, the All Big Ten first team was released. Zach Eady. Uh, Braden Smith on that list, amongst others. Terrence Shannon Jr. of Illinois, Marcus Damask of Illinois, Jameer Young of Maryland, and Boo Bowie of Northwestern. And the Big Ten Player of the Year, no shocker here. It's got to be unanimous, right? Zach Eady. Is that unanimous or does it say? Uh, I'm trying to see if it's unanimous or not. Might not say on the initial posting. Yeah, I mean, it's not. It's got to be, right? That would be my guess. So, Zach Eady is the Big Ten Player of the Year. Braden Smith, his teammate, join him as the first team all Big Ten performers. I, I don't know if this is even an award. Is there a sixth man of the year? There is that, obviously are in other categories of basketball. Correct. I don't know if there is in the Big Ten. I don't know Ten. if the Big Ten does that or not, but I'd be curious to see uh, that listing. But no surprise there, right? No surprise at all. Are you with me, Jake? I have no issue. I'm sure maybe Purdue fans might take an affront to it, but – what Fred Hoiberg has done at Nebraska this year, going to be firmly in the tournament, one of their best years ever. I mean, it, I have no problem with him getting co coach of the year honors. He's done a good job. Yeah, I, I mean, unquestionably. You, and, and, you know, it's interesting. On a side note, my ADD kicks in here. Yesterday, we're sitting there, and Shannon got like a Facebook memory. And it was a Facebook memory of a post from 2020, where she and I were at dinner, and she's like, this is so crazy. We're at dinner and like we're, to watch games, and they're like canceling these games, and there's no one here. <laughs> yeah, if we're in that week where and, you and, go back and look at time hop and stuff, correct. you're going to And the relive replies, that. the replies are fascinating. But one of the replies was, yeah, Fred Hoiberg is like super sick at the, oh, yeah. the Nebraska game. And that, I think he never did test positive for COVID, right? But – and this is now going down a different rabbit hole, I realize. But the other day when, when the Minnesota Timberwolves were here, <laughs> I, I turned around to the guy next to me at the game, and I go, here's a trivia question for you. And he said, okay. And I said, I, I don't think this is now going to be the case, but it's still possible. I go, of all the players in this game, between the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Indiana Pacers, which one, if you had, to, if we got on a time machine right now, Great Scott in our 1.21 gigawatts and went 125 years into the future. Which player that is involved in this basketball game is the most likely to still have some people recognize their name 125 years from now? And he's like, I don't know, maybe Edwards or Halliburton. And I'm like, it's Rudy or it's Rudy Gobert. Yeah, it is. But I Shutting worry down that, the sports world. Correct. Hold on. Like that, that is a correct. indelible image for us. Correct. But I feel like if you went up and you asked that same question, but phrase this, which player reminds you the most of that time? I think that as the years go by, well, that list gets I'm, smaller and smaller. But what Not I'm saying are, is, I realize that, and I don't want to go down the rabbit hole where people then debate like the severity of what happened and whether it sure. was valid and whatever else. But my point being, 
because of the fact that that was a pandemic that has not lasted for a half a decade or a decade, maybe it does dwindle the historical significance of it. He's in a history book automatically Correct. because of that. But yeah. there is, if there is any chance, and I don't know that this is the case is my point, but if there is any chance that many, 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 many years from now people are studying the COVID pandemic, Rudy Gobert's positive test is what began the snowball of the world essentially shutting down. I thought you were going deeper than that because it's not just the positive test. It is the nonchalant touching all the microphones in that press conference and then testing positive. Correct. Like egg on your face of all of it. No, but correct. But my point being, I remember, and I'm only saying it because it was this week. Right. You know, it's interesting in hindsight. I, I remember I was set to go to the IndyCar finale the next day a matter of fact, I take that back. I flew to, to St. Pete the next day. Got to St. Pete, was not on the first practice session. Woke up at like 10 o'clock in the morning in my hotel to a flurry of emails and texts saying, we are done until June. And I'm like, wait, what? And But it was the night before, I'll never forget, I was talking with someone about a business proposal and Shannon walked in and said, the NBA just canceled their season. And I go, what did you just say? And she goes, Rudy Gobert just tested positive. Now, there are a whole lot of factors that go into that, and the NBA having more test kits and everything else, I, you know, th- that's a whole different talk show. But my point being, Rudy Gobert was significant. But Fred Hoiberg, right. is he comes to mind also because when those were being canceled and he was on the, the sidelines and he was so sick. But at that time, that, that I'm saying that only to say – you forget that Hoiberg's been there for more than just like yeah. a year or two. He's been there a couple of years yeah. at Nebraska. This is the best job that he's done and, probably. And I thought Miles did a really good job at Nebraska before yeah. he was replaced. I, I would agree with you on that. And kind of to put a bow in terms of why those time hop memories pop up. Like last night, John Rothstein's on CBS Sports. And I can't remember if it was the Hofstra Stony Brook game or, or which game it was, but he's doing one of the CAA games in studio. And he references the fact And there's a lot of teams, especially mid-majors, that feel this. I get it. I understand what the pandemic was, the way it impacted so many lives, the lives that were lost. But when you tie it back into sports, think of all the teams that that, that's always going to be a memory that punched their ticket already. There were conference finals that had already happened before the the sport shut down. And he brought it up. He's like, yeah, uh, they won it in 2020. And then a week later, no tournament. No. You know, actually, in that game between the Timberwolves and the Pacers, I wonder if Obi Toppin went up to Rudy Gobert and was like, hey, man, thanks. You cost me an ass. Because I'm telling you right now. Oh, yeah, Dayton. Dayton Dayton was going to be the number one seed in that tournament. And Dayton might have won the whole thing. They would have had a strong chance at it. I mean, Dayton might have won the whole thing, right? Yep. Yep. And, I mean, there's so many many spinoffs of that. But but nonetheless, congratulations to Fred Hoiberg, Matt Painter, co-coaches of the year in the Big Ten. But for Purdue now – the the challenge becomes more so than Nebraska, more so than you know Illinois, who had multiple players, first team All Big Ten. Purdue now now is when the season really begins for Purdue because they were supposed to be here. Purdue's supposed to be the number one seed in the tournament. Purdue is supposed to be multiple players, first team All Big Ten. Purdue's supposed to have the Big Ten Player of the Year. Purdue's supposed to have the Big Ten Coach of the Year. And Purdue's supposed to be playing basketball in another month. And that's where the challenge lies for them because the obstacle is now in front of them where even the Big Ten tournament, they can stub their toe in the Big Ten tournament and they're they're okay. People forget about the Big Ten tournament. People forget about the postseason tournaments now because it all happens. It's all about what happens right after that, right? And so – you know, unless you are like UConn that all of a sudden catches fire one year and blitzes your way through the Big East tournament and then just continues. But that's rare. If you get beat early in your conference tournament, it doesn't matter if you then pick up the pieces and, and make a four to six game run. That's the challenge for Purdue. A guy that's been coaching at his university longer than anybody in Division One. He took that title over when who retired? Coach K. Close. Uh, Jim Beheim. Correct. Jim Beheim. Jim Beheim stepped down. Greg Campy at Oakland became the longest tenured coach at a school in Division One, And he is going to join us next because his team 
is taking on Milwaukee tonight in the Horizon League Championship at the Indiana Farmers Coliseum. That conversation next. Need a new furnace or air conditioner? Call the professor.
you know, with the Raiders now in Las Vegas and the Athletics rumored to be going there, uh, this is the last team left in Oakland, right? It's not really Oakland, California, I realize. But <laughs> Oakland University going to be playing tonight in the Horizon League Championship. Listen, folks, I've said this a million times. I'm going to make it a million and one. When I was a kid growing up in Indianapolis, it was such a thrill to me to go to, for example, Butler games because it was college athletics. And it was affordable. It was family-friendly. It was centrally located. And I got to see Division One college athletics. Not only do you get the opportunity tonight at a fabulous historic venue like Indiana Farmers Coliseum, which I love, but you get to see big-time Division I college basketball between 22 and 11 Oakland and Milwaukee, who is on a six-game win streak, and both teams vying for a chance to get into the big dance, to punch their ticket into the big dance. And it is family-friendly, great environment. Would love for folks to be able to to go out and watch basketball. If you can't make it in person, you can see it live on ESPN at 7 o'clock. And one of the guys who will be coaching on the sidelines for Oakland, Greg Campy, joins us on the program. Coach, thanks for the time. How are you? I'm doing good, guys. How are you doing today? You know, we've got no complaints, man. And I'll tell you what, you are – I I love your story because, you know, here you are. You're the longest tenured coach in Division I at a school – I think that you have done an unbelievable job with Oakland just in kind of riding that program through transition of different levels and now obviously a mainstay here in the Horizon League. But it is not often at that level that a team sustains if they're a one seed like all the – I shouldn't say not often, but it is a challenge, right, to to sustain as a number one and make it all the way into the conference championship. What do you like about the way your team has been able to stay the course this season? Well – they're, they're, it's a great group of kids, and in this day and age with the transfer portal and piecing teams together, to get an old team that's been around a while is unique, and they, they, they really are. They're just a good group of guys, and they're very talented, but they care a lot about each other, and anytime you talk about championships, you hear those things about teams, and, and I'm fortunate enough to coach one like that. You know, I want to – before we get – into the game here. I I did have a question for you, Coach, about – I was having a conversation yesterday about the Horizon League and just the winds of change in college basketball with NIL and the portal. I mean, I think we know that it's – you know, I mean, it's rapidly changing before our very eyes. Realignment, all of it. Now, now, tell me if I'm too optimistic here. Is the benefit for this perhaps for the smaller conferences like the Horizon League? And by that I mean I think there are players that are going to go to – a power five program thinking they're going to get a big NIL deal and it doesn't work out or they transfer to a place and then somebody else transfers in front of them. And then that, that doesn't work out. And it feels like the horizon league is one of the leagues that might be able to maintain more stability of roster and expectation of players coming in. Am I being too optimistic? Way too optimistic. Yes. That's <laughs> not, it, it's a, going to be a one year deal and, until and I think this is down the road. I think that they're going to go to unionizing and, and, and having contracts. And then it'll stabilize. That's, that's the only way it'll stay. I'm not for it, but it's the only way it'll stabilize because then I can sign a kid to a two-year, four-year, three-year, one-year, whatever, and not have to worry about, you know, he's here and then he's gone. And, and I mean, I think this year you'll see 3,000 kids in the portal. You know, last year it was like 1,800. And with the NIL and, and – if you were a kid, you'd do it too. Why wouldn't you go in there and see what you're worth, right? Go out there and see what somebody's willing to pay you. And that this, it's just, it's crazy. The toothpaste is out of the tube, and and we've just got to try and figure out, you know, how to adjust. And I had seven new kids this year. I'll probably have seven or eight next year, and I think everybody will. It's just the way it is. So you you think the, and I hate to say it this way, coach, but. I guess the the challenge, if there's not unionization, for example, for like a Horizon League or you know Ohio Valley or some of the smaller leagues, would be that players are using that to to get their foot in the door and get noticed, get minutes, get points, get get stats, and then try to catapult that into a higher paying opportunity. Essentially, yeah, I'm not saying it. I'm I know it. I mean, it's they tell you in recruiting. You know, I'm recruiting a kid, and he says, you know, I'm just. You know, I'm not being recruited by Michigan. I want to come to you and prove I can play at Michigan. And now I've got to sit there and say, okay, you know, let's do this. You know, right. I mean, in the old days, I would have said, well, then you need to go somewhere else, you know, because we don't do that here. But that's 
they're all it's they're all that way. I mean, I've got the player of the year in the conference. He's got one more year. He'll go in the portal next week when our season's over, you know, just to see what he's worth. And I've almost got to tell him to do it because, you know, I can't pay him 150000 and then he'll probably – he had 30 at Xavier, you know. Uh, we beat Xavier at 30 and he probably made a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars that night because everybody in the big East is going to want it. And it's, it's, I, I know for a fact that people have reached out to his family and, and that it's just, and, and that's why the unionization, the contracts is probably going to have to happen because it's just, I mean, it's going to get brutal and it, you know, it is what it is, man. You just, you got to accept it. You adapt or you die. Right. And so we just have to adapt to it. A lot of people in my generation are leaving because of it. Uh, That's but, what I was going to ask you is I love the – I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're still here, right? I mean, to quote Joel Cornetta Butler, you're still here. Um, so what is it that where you say, look, I'm in it? Because I love what I do and I love the kids. And, you know, like I'm grandpa now, you know. You know, I had kids and I was the bad guy. My mom and dad were the good people. And now I'm like the – I'm the grandpa. So <laughs> I just – you know, I've – I just love doing what I do and I, I want to keep doing it. I can bitch and complain about it or I can just accept it and figure it out and try and be successful. And, you know, you still, I still, even if I only have them a year or two, I still think I can make an impact on their lives and make them better people. And that's really what, at, when you get to be a grandpa, that's what you want. By the way, Trey Townsend, the, the player you're talking about, right? That's been a great player for you this year. Yep. Yep. Uh, you guys coach and, and, I like this. I commend this in the fact that you were not afraid at the beginning of the year to go out and play, right? I mean, you you, you go out and it's like, you know what, we're, we're going to take on right out of the box, three or four power fives. We're going to compete. We're going to go out there and play. How does that help your team in the long run? Well, we've always done that. And sometimes we we're mad that we do, you know, but for the most part, I mean, we've got 13 power five, power six wins in the last, 20 years so we've been able to win some of them and and when you do that you know somebody gives you a check for a hundred thousand dollars and and you beat them that that's really a fulfilling thing right uh but we do it because of the money for sure but we also do it because i think once we see what those teams do to us nobody in our level is going to be able to do what they do to us so if we can have success or figure out how to you know, make adjustments or how to have a counter on an offensive play or maybe how to guard a bigger guy. You know, when we see that in our league play, we're ready for it. And I think it's helped us win a championship this year. I really do. We've won a lot of close games. And I think that because, of you know, we lost a close game at Ohio State, we're tied with Illinois with six minutes to go and we lose. And then we have a close game with Xavier and we win. And I think that propelled us into league you know, we could beat anybody in a close game. And, you know, we got lucky last night and won a close one. And, and you, in tournament time, you have to you got to be one point ahead. That's it. Head coach of the Oakland Golden Grizzlies, Greg Campy, is our guest. Coach, the final four, the semifinals of the Horizon League tournament featured you guys, the top seed, and then a five, a six, and a seven, your finals versus Milwaukee, the sixth seed. How does that matchup speak to the depth that the Horizon League has had, not just this year, but for the last couple of years? Well, I told my sports information director, we just got back from Shooter, and I told him, I said, you need to check this out because I'll bet you I'm right. I don't think in the mid-major level a number one seed has ever had to play an eight, seven, and a six, and all three of them had 20 wins. Fort Wayne has 21, Cleveland State had 20, and Milwaukee has 20 tonight. I mean, when you play the eight, seven, and six, you're supposed to be playing teams that have either a losing record or a 500 record, right? We're and in the Horizon League, they all got 20 wins. That's how good the league was this year. And, you know, it, it didn't there, – there's no difference between us. And we played Fort Wayne in the opening round. They're the eighth seed, and there's no difference. I mean, a basket is the difference between us. So, you know, the league is just – it's the best it's ever been since Butler left. You know, obviously, when you have a team like Butler and you go to the Final Four, that makes your league pretty special. Um, once they moved on – you know, the league kind of stepped back a little bit, and now it's rebuilding. And this year, by for the 11 years we've been in it, this is the best it's ever been. And when you get this far into it, Coach, are there wrinkles that still come out from teams? I mean, you know, you've seen Milwaukee. You know Milwaukee. They've won six straight, but and they know you. Do you just say, look, we're just going to push our chips in at what we do and have confidence in it, or are you still looking for different variations that, that would surprise them? Well, I think it's it's more like the NBA in now in that, you know, 
I mean, the Pacers are playing the Pistons, right? Game one, game two. Now you're in game three and you split or you're two and oh or whatever. And you know what adjustments they've made. Now, how do you come back with something to adjust to what they did? And, you know, like how we guard DJ Freeman tonight, we're going to guard him a little different than we did the first two times. Not a lot, but a little bit. We're going to try and just show a little different wrinkle here or there that maybe can bide you some time in the game. You know, they'll figure it out through the course of the game. But if we can get through the first eight minutes and and screw up what they spent their whole night and day doing, you know, and they'll do the same to us. That That's really what it becomes. It's more NBA-ish now than it is college basketball. Again, tonight it's going to be Oakland and Milwaukee in the Horizon League Championship. Greg Campy is our guest. He is the head coach of the Oakland Golden Grizzlies. Finally, Coach, you know, this is a league where at one time the conference tournament were still on site. Now, of course, coming to the Coliseum, been that way for a couple of years. What do you like about the the neutral site venue of it, I guess, in playing in a city like Indianapolis, which is obviously pretty centrally located for the league itself? Well, first of all, I love Indianapolis. I mean, I, I've always thought it's it's just a great city. I could live here. I mean, I I actually come here now and then just to stay at the JW and and you know screw around. So, uh, got a couple of great cigar bars. You know, it's a oh hell yeah. What's your cigar of choice? Uh, my, the cigar I smoke. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, oh, shit. Punch Grand Crew. No. Oil uh, de Monterey. Nope. Nope. Oh my God. <laughs> Boulevard? My one. It's a Fuente. It's, oh, uh, man. There you go. Um, I got yeah. you. Either Opus a, either a Opus, Opus X one. or a Hemingway. Yeah. Or, yeah, they got 858s. They got a yeah. lot of them, man. Fuentes are, Fuentes are strong. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you that. But the Opus X is my favorite. <laughs> well, that's a – I've, hey. I've got one at home waiting for me. <laughs> I was going to say, the Opus X is a we just won the conference tournament cigar, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, and when you cut, I'm curious of this. When you come to Indy, have you been here? For example, like NBA wise, I, you know, I realize it's probably tough to do because it's in season, in season. And I know that he's. I don't think he's still in Washington. But Kendrick Nunn's been a good player in the league that played for you, if I'm not mistaken. So, do you get a chance yeah. to go and watch your guys that make it into the league? Oh, sure. Uh, I got Jamal Kane right now. Kendrick is in Greece this year. He he left Washington and, and got a really lucrative deal in Greece. So uh, Jamal Kane is what the Heat is, though, my last player that's still in the NBA. We've had five in the last 15 years, but he's my he's the only one I got right now. So, yeah, well, you know, I, I won't really come to Indy for a game, but I would. But I can't during the season. Right. But, you know, when we play in Detroit, I go and, and we'll stay in touch with him, obviously. So. But, well, Coach, uh, keep anyway. that keep that Opus X in the humidor. Keep it ready. Hopefully you'll fire it up here in the next day, and then maybe you need to get another one for when you make a run here in the NCAA tournament. But it starts tonight with Milwaukee. That game, 7 o'clock at Indiana Farmers Coliseum. Greg Campy and his 22-11 and 11 Oakland Golden Grizzlies for the Horizon League title. Appreciate the time, Coach, and we will watch to see what happens with the roster for next year and see you back here again in a year, all right? Appreciate you having Oakland on. Thank you. I appreciate it. Greg Campy, the head coach at the Oakland Golden Grizzlies. Again, 7 o'clock tonight. Uh, big news in the NFL continues the cycle of big names signing elsewhere. We'll let you know the biggest signing, and Stephen Holder will join us to talk about that and more next. JMV for the best in realty. Mark Deedle, Mark Deedle Realty. 317-755-4232. That's 317-755-4232. Online, markdeedle.com, Mark D-I-E-T-E-L.com. Today, Claire and Gary in Danville, they have a great story. Retiring, moving to Florida, the home in Danville on the market for almost a year with the previous agent. Nothing moved. They hired Mark Deedle, and things changed fast. Got the offer they thought they would never get. That's what he does. He gets you exactly what you're looking for. The best in realty is Mark Deedle and Mark Deedle Realty. In fact, Mark Deedle guarantees your home sold at a mutually agreed upon price and deadline, or he will buy it. It's Mark Deedle, Mark Deedle Realty, 317-755-4232, 317-755-4232. Online, markdeedle.com. That's Mark, D-I-E-T-E-L.com. Today. Puccini's seven north side locations. Puccini's pizza and pasta.com. Puccini's seven north side locations. Puccini's pizza and pasta.com. Founded.
started right here in Indianapolis in 1991 and winner of the World Pizza Championships in Parma, Italy. The IRS finally caught up with Louie. I hadn't paid my taxes in eight years. I owed the IRS a lot. Greg Campy's not messing around with the Opus X, man. As somebody who sold cigars for seven and a half years, I can tell you that's one of the top flights from Arturo Fuente. I like Punch Grand Crew a great deal. Hoyle de Monterey and Punch Rothschild's also very good. I think Stephen Holder has been known to have a cigar from time to time. He probably doesn't have time right now because we are in the flurry of NFL free agency. But, Stephen, you are or are not an occasional cigar dabbler. Yeah, I am. Um, I could use a cigar and some bourbon right now. I would much <laughs> rather be doing that than sitting by the phone, by the computer, accomplishing nothing. So, yeah, <laughs> that sounds very good right now, actually. So here's the thing. If you are an NFL writer, and by the way, Derek Henry just agreed apparently to a two-year deal with the Baltimore Ravens. That's the latest. Which is a great fit, by the way. Love to, to fall off the board. Yeah, and I'm listen, I'm a huge fan of Derek Henry. I, I just think his... Um, 
I love watching him play. That probably shouldn't say that in Indianapolis, and I guess it's good he's out of the division. But uh, the reality is you probably have, if you are an NFL writer of the Indianapolis Colts covering free agency, you probably have the word re-signed or retained in like a copy and you just hit you know paste right because so far that's what the Colts have done this is by design or Chris Ballard has not necessarily looked outside of the roster until he simply said I've got these players that I've got to get taken care of well it's by design for sure um I know there are a ton of deals uh getting signed around the around the league and uh if you're a Colts fan you're you're probably you know, feeling like you're missing out, and and I get it. What I would say to that is, free agency technically starts tomorrow at what four o'clock, I guess. And and so what you're seeing right now is certainly deals being agreed to, but but what you're seeing from the Colts is that this is essentially preventing their guys from getting to the market. So if these deals didn't get done yesterday, and potentially there's more to come, we'll see. Uh, but if these deals don't get done before tomorrow, you lose all control of the situation as, or at least you lose, you lose the upper hand as the, the team that, that had the rights to that player. So it's about priorities. Uh, they're not the only team doing this. There are lots of other teams re-signing their guys for the very same reason. Um, and, and the guys who are getting away either, either were not in their team's plans or, they weren't committed to spending what it was going to take to keep them um, and, and guys made other decisions. So, you know, look, we'll see, but there's tons of other players out there. We'll see how, what happens. Uh, but certainly this is by design for the Colts in terms of the priority in free agency. I don't think they're done. I think they will have uh, some notable outside signings. That doesn't mean they're going to get the biggest guy on the market. I'm just saying players who will come in and play for them, uh, right away and, and make a difference. Steven, whether it is dollar amounts, whether it is length of a contract, whether it's the outright decision to bring back a player of the Colts in-house signings that they've done to this point, which one surprised you the most? Um, I don't think I was surprised by any of them. I would say I thought Grover Stewart did really well. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you that um, in terms of the amount that he got, uh, he got a bump over his last contract, which I think was, was averaging around 10 million a year. If I recall, I, I think that's right. Uh, this one, I believe is 13 million on average per year. If you spread it out and do the math. Uh, so that's pretty good for a guy who I think is 30 years old or about to turn 30, you know, he'll be 33 when this deal is up. Uh, that's that's definitely on the, the latter end of his career. And you're talking about a nose tackle here. We're not talking about, you know, sort of a, an athletic defensive tackle a la DeForest Buckner. I'm not criticizing it whatsoever. I'm saying for a 30-year-old guy who's going to be 33 when the contract's up and plays a position that really gets taken for granted, that's a really good deal. I, I thought that, you know, a guy who's not made a Pro Bowl or anything like that, I mean, that's a, that's a good deal. And I think he has to walk away pretty happy from this negotiation if you're, you're Grover Stewart. Steven, I thought, and you tell me if, you know, I asked Greg Campy, the head basketball coach at Oakland, a question a couple minutes ago and said, am I being too optimistic? And he said, you're absolutely being too optimistic. So you tell me if I'm too optimistic on this. I thought the off-the-radar, like not really mentioned, potential really good news coup for the Colts so far – is Tyquan Lewis at two years and twelve million? Because I, I know that there have been consistency and even health issues with him, but to me, that's a value because there is still, I think, something below the surface that has yet to be scratched. Your thoughts? Well, I think what I would say is when he's healthy, you you really see what he can do. So last year, if you see if you watch him the first half of the season last season. Tyquan Lewis was very unimpressive, to be completely blunt. Um, you didn't notice him. He wasn't making any type of plays on a consistent basis. And what I realized over the course of the season is as he got further away from his injury, he got much, much better. So I think the thinking here is now he's, he's healthy. He's, he won't be coming off an injury. He's had season-ending injuries two years in a row and has still made it back and had some impact. 
So I think the thinking here is, all right, this guy is now going to be coming off a healthy offseason, presumably, you know, knock on wood, and they're going to have him much further down the road uh, than he was at the beginning of last year. He's always been a player who, who maybe doesn't put up the numbers, but he, he always makes – there's always a two or three or four games a year where Taekwon Lewis makes a handful of plays where like they don't win the game without that. And so look in the grand scheme with, with the, with a 200 and what's the salary cap, 250 some odd million, you know, with, with the salary cap where it is today, giving Taekwon Lewis 6 million a year, I, I sleep just fine with if I'm the Colts and, and frankly, I think he'll earn it. So I don't have a problem with that at all. I think it's a good deal. And and they want to play with a rotation at defensive line. They don't have, you know, Nick Bosa on their team. They don't have Miles Garrett. So what they have to do is they have to get it by committee. And they actually did a really good job of getting it by committee last year. Uh, they could add some more. They could always stand to add some more. But But the group that they have was very productive. More sacks than any team we've seen in the Indianapolis era of this franchise. So that has to matter to some degree, for sure. Colts beat writer for ESPN.com, Stephen Holder, is our guest. Stephen, when the contract was released or reported that the Las Vegas Raiders had retained Gardner Minshew, or had acquired Gardner Minshew, I beg your pardon, two years, $25 million, $15 million guaranteed, I think that put to bed for a lot of Colts fans the idea that, oh, maybe they could retain Minshew because they're not, they weren't going to pay that for a backup quarterback. And it looks like whatever the Raiders are doing, good for Minshew, He's going to be a starter, at least have an opportunity to take a starting role, assuming the Raiders don't do anything at quarterback in the draft. Your reaction to Minshew getting his payday, and then stylistically, what do the Colts look for, and where do they look for it in their next quarterback, for their next backup quarterback? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, hell of a job by whoever Gardner Minshew's agent is, by the way. <clears throat> that that is <laughs> that is impressive, and I don't mean that to be like insulting to Gardner. I- I'm just saying, like that's that's a really good deal, and for for what it is. I mean, you're talking about a guy who who may or may not be the starter there. We don't know. I mean, he's got to compete for it, and. Even if he loses that job, I mean that's a really good contract. I know that there's there's probably some some escalators that are that are factored into that twenty five million. So there's there's a good chance he doesn't make that you know that whole twenty five million. I mean, Fifteen I, I million guaranteed, that. still though. To your point, like that's exactly. that's really good. Exactly. I mean, I mean, if you're the Colts, and I, I'm sure they were monitoring what was going on with him. I, I never thought he was going to come back because I know he wanted a situation where he had a chance to play more rather than, than here where Anthony Richardson is the unquestioned starter. So I thought he might opt for greener pastures in terms of playing time, but I didn't know what the money would look like. He would, I thought he'd make more than last year for sure. Right. I mean, it wasn't going to be a one year, $3 million deal. He, He earned more than that to his credit, but I never envisioned this deal. Um, so hell of a job. Good job by David Butts, by the way, his agent. The other thing I would say is, um, you know, I think for the Raiders, that is, I think it speaks to to where teams are at that quarterback, and 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 just continue to thank your, thank the heavens that if you're a Colts fan, you're not having to deal with with that whole um, market. Frankly, I mean, it's it's tough, you know, it's tough out there, and and, and teams have to make really aggressive moves. To, to ensure that they have, you know, some, some viable options at that position. And, and it's just really tough, man. So, anyway, uh, that's the other takeaway. Uh, for the Colts moving forward at, at the backup spot, um, I understand the question when you say stylistically. I, I do think you have to consider that. But I also don't think it's going to be the number one concern. I think last year you saw, last season, you saw that, that it doesn't matter that much. Uh, in terms of the quarterbacks being similar, um, there's a, there couldn't be more difference between Gardner Minshew and Anthony Richardson, right? And and they found ways to be successful on offense with each one. I, I think the limitations you may have, may or may not have seen with Gardner Minshew um, in the game as opposed to uh, or in the center as opposed to Anthony Richardson. I think they had less to do with style and more just to do with with some of Gardner Minshew's. Um, decision-making and things like that. So 
So I think that Shane Steichen's smart enough to make it work with either guy, uh, with with whoever he has. I think it's more about just get a guy who can who can be effective and 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 maybe not necessarily need a lot of practice time, which is really the biggest um, job description of a backup quarterback. So I don't know who that is though, uh, to, uh, which is probably the natural next question. I don't know who that is. There have been a surprising number of, of backup quarterbacks already go, or at least sort of mid-level quarterbacks. So that market's been pretty busy. I don't think they can sit on their hands for too long here. Steven, do you ever get – Steven Holder's our guest from ESPN.com. Do you ever get tipped a story? And by that I mean somebody says, hey, you didn't hear this from me, but let me, let me tell you something that's going to come down the pike that you kind of go, yeah, okay. And then all of a sudden, like it grows legs, and you go, "Oh wow, maybe I should have looked at this a little more seriously." <laughs> yes, yeah, all the time. Andrew yeah, Luck saga would be one of them, right? I mean, you remember we all kind of laughed at the whole snow or excuse me, snowboarding incident, and you know, turned out to be true, right? That 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 one jumps to mind. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, that would be that would be true. I mean, I think I think. The, the problem with that one was we just don't we, we still don't know to, like to what degree that played a role. But yes, the the, the way that rumor started was was laughable because it just it was it sounded so ridiculous. I think it was on like a message board or something. The the other thing though, th- it happens in different ways, and and I'm probably should let you finish your question, but <laughs> but it it happens in different ways. Like sometimes you hear it from a credible source, and you're but you're still like okay, I, I hear you, but like. There's no way, right? Um, and I end up, I end up holding on to far more information than I ever report for this very reason. Um, you know, the, the Jonathan Taylor situation last year. I remember getting a call in July, like, "Hey, this is going to be a thing," and I was like, "Yeah, all right, you know, we'll see what happens." And oh, it was a thing, all right, you know. So, yes, it happens all the time. Yes. <laughs> okay, so here's what I got today. And I'm going to do what I typically do when these come down the pike, and that is ask you. Okay? Here we go. (laughs) Hey, Jake, keep me anonymous, please. Okay? So this is anonymous, Stephen. Yes. I have a very reliable source inside the Colts organization who has never been wrong for me before but does not tell me a lot. However, he has said that Jim Irsay has directed Chris Ballard to make the move to get Marvin Harrison Jr. regardless of cost. Because he knows it will put fans in the seats. I don't think they need help in that area, granted. Uh, and go. it would make the offense dangerous with Richardson, Taylor, Pittman, and now Marvin Harrison Jr. I can't mm-hmm. say it will happen for certain, but the word has definitely come down to Chris Ballard. Your thoughts? Hmm. Um, okay. I don't think it can be. Right. Now, l- let me let me lead the witness here, okay? Yes. I, Steven, I don't think it can be totally dismissed as preposterous right. because I think that Jim Mercer is a very nostalgic person. I think that Jim Mercer yeah. has a great affinity for the history and the great players of his franchise more than most owners do. A la, he brings back like Baltimore Colts to flip the coin, you know, to, to do honorary stuff at Lucas oil and everybody in the crowds like this is who exactly. And then <laughs> in addition to that, I mean, obviously he is a phenomenal talent. No question about that. And my understanding is he has flippantly made comment before about like joking about Marvin Harrison Jr. Now, all of that said, the table is yours. I I don't think you can dismiss it. I mean, look, do I have any personal knowledge of it? No. But I also, like you outlined, I also knew Jim Mercer and how he thinks and how he works. And <laughs> listen, I've been on the other end of, of 45 minute phone calls when he starts talking about nostalgic stuff. OK, so you're not wrong about that. Let me tell you, like, if anything, we're underselling how much nostalgia means to him. I mean, so there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, he's he I, I think that he. Did he present Marvin for the Hall of Fame? I can't remember. Yes, I believe that's correct because he's going to present Freeney, or at least he's been asked to. He presented Edge. I believe that's the third, right, Marvin? My point point being, like, him and and Marvin do have a special relationship. So, um, and, 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 you know, few people really understand Marvin Harrison, like, (laughs) senior. Like, there aren't that many people who could say they really know him. And I think Demerce is among those people. So, anyway, what does all of that mean? Eh, hard to say, but – but would would Jim Ursay 
would he be over the moon to have Marvin Harrison Jr.? Yes. But will it happen? And is it is it doable? Eh, I don't know about that. That's going to be tough. And, and and Chris Ballard is is pretty good at talking or say out of things too. That's the other thing here to to keep in mind. He has had to do that in the past. He he failed when it came to Jim to uh, Jeff Saturday, but but there are other times when they have they have had heated discussions about things and. And he has stepped up and, and said, no, we're not doing that. So I, I don't know that I, I would say this is probably in that category because I can't see Chris Ballard doing what it would take to make a move that aggressive, uh, just given how conservative he tends to be. But I'm here for it. Let's do it. <laughs> Stephen Holder is our guest, covers the Colts for ESPN.com. Stephen, where do things stand in terms of what you've heard, if there's any advanced whispers, because as you mentioned – the real stuff gets going tomorrow when the leverage for teams that hone in on players kind of goes away. Where do things stand on where the Colts will attack out of the gate tomorrow? And additionally, this one is a trade aspect. The rumors have continued to be there for Chiefs cornerback Legereus Sneed. Any updates on that front in terms of if that's still something they're in on? So I'll say, like, overall, I I do think I, – I told JMV this yesterday. I My sense – is that defense will be the focus. And and I don't mean to say it's going to be the top defensive player on the market. That I don't I don't know, but but I, I think that's where that's where their focus will be because I think the 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 offensive strengths in the draft kind of line up for the Colts. So, you know, particularly a wide receiver, which is a really deep spot this year. So so I, I think defense is where you can make some hay here. Um We'll have to see. In terms of Sneed, you know, what we can't say, what, what's hard to say is what is the, what would it take to land him in terms of the trade compensation? You know, I, I think in terms of the contract, you know, look, it's, it would be big. And, and that is something that they would have to decide. But, but the trade compensation is really important here. What does that look like? And, and that's hard to say. I don't think you're looking at a, well, let's put it this way. If they want your first round pick, I don't think that's a conversation that I would engage in. Um, if you're talking about a second round pick, now I'm, I'm answering the phone. I'm talking about the Chiefs. You know, what are they looking for? Uh, they, they got a haul for, for Tyree Kill a couple of years ago, but I just think that's a different level of, of acquisition. I don't think this is anything close to that. So it's a different conversation for me. Um, I, I would say this in terms of the Colts, they they definitely have a very high opinion of the player. That doesn't mean they can land him because there's lots of variables here. But but in terms of whether they whether they like the player, whether he fits, all that 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 is that is all those boxes are checked for sure. So you know they've been monitoring this for a while. Um, they were disappointed when he got franchised. <laughs> so yeah, they they definitely have interest. We'll see what happens. And the other thing I want to add here is just. In general, I've been having these conversations just with people just overall, just about free agency in the NFL in general. And one of the things I was thinking about is, I have no idea what prompted this, but um, one of the things I was thinking about is that, you know, we we have this fundamental misunderstanding about NFL free agency because it's so fundamentally different than other sports, free agency in other sports. Like the the NBA and, and baseball, like free agency in those sports is a bonanza. The difference is they don't have the franchise tag, and so you know exactly how we're, you know kind of segues from the the Snead conversation, right? He's that's a tough acquisition because he has been franchised. You know if if you're if he's in the NBA and he's a free agent, well he just goes to the highest bidder or whoever, wherever he wants to go. Uh, the, the NFL the franchise tag is just it is an absolute positive game changer and in a negative fashion for the player because the best players get franchised. It is what it is. So that's what you're dealing with, you know, with a guy like that and, and most of these top players. It's why a player like Kirk Cousins can basically name his price, even though really I say this as someone who thinks Kirk Cousins is pretty good. Kirk Cousins has never won anything <laughs> and he can name his price because 
Uh, it's so rare that you get a, a, a franchise quarterback who's free and unencumbered on the market like that. Okay, Stephen, here's my last one. All right, you got. I'm going to give you get three seconds to think about it. Eddie's over here, by the way, jumping through a hula hoop, telling me to rap. So that means that we got to. This is the. This is brisk, right? So you got okay, three go seconds to think about it, and then you got to give me an answer. Okay. Uh, let's say that a kid is a huge fan of Justin Fields and he has already told his parents that he wants to dress as Justin Fields for Halloween coming up on October 31st of 2024. <laughs> the parents okay. need to go out and buy a helmet of what team? Oh my God. Uh, um, that's hard. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry. Point being, I, point being, I would assume there maybe is still a place where he would be a starter and that would yeah. up the price that you're going to have to pay to get him via trade and Chicago's sitting in a pretty good spot and, you know, the Colts trying to trade into either that one slot to get Marvin Harrison Jr. or mm. trying to sign Justin Fields, either one, the price is going to be a little bit higher than simply a couple of those yeah. peanut butter taffies and a Reese's Cup, right? Yeah, maybe Denver. I don't know. I, I think the problem the problem is so, a couple of these teams that I thought were were landing spots. They've now gotten their quarterback. Right. So it's it's tricky. Yeah. All right, we're gonna go with Denver. We're gonna write it down right now. Stephen Holder predicts Denver for Justin Fields. Tweet that out, <laughs> would you? I'm kidding, of course. All right, Stephen. Uh, not long before the cigars and the bourbon, but a lot of work to do between now and then, and we will continue to read it at ESPN.com. Appreciate the time. All right, you got it. Hey, Doc. All right, Stephen Holder, of course, native of the state of Florida. I actually called Stephen on Saturday and said, look, I got free time. Where should I go? He said, oh, man, there's some nice places around there. And so I made the mistake of driving to Clearwater Beach to try to find dinner, and I had the same idea as 115,000 people that were all walking around and I was in a car. It was a total, total disaster. Uh, Paul Casaro, by the way, UND. He's got him rolling. Not like driving in traffic in Clearwater Beach. He's going to join us in under 15. You've heard him on national radio. You've seen him.
okay. I said to Eddie Garrison, hey, play some Violet Femmes coming back. Eddie said, why? Well, I'll explain when we come back. Jimmy, can you, by any stretch of the imagination, tell me why I would play the Violent Femmes right now? Jake, for or the sake I... of good radio, I will say no, I cannot. Okay, then I'm going to ask our next guest. He is the head basketball coach for Milwaukee. They have won six straight. They have found their way into the Horizon League championship tonight, taking on Oakland for their right to try to punch a ticket into the NCAA tournament. So, Bart Lundy, my question for you. do you Would you know why we played the Violent Femmes coming out of the break leading into your interview? Because they are from uh, the great state of Wisconsin and the city of Milwaukee, I think. <laughs> you, bingo, baby. And I knew it, Bart, because, Coach, you and I are about the same age, right? So I was just telling these guys, I'm like, like in eighth grade, all of a sudden, everybody started playing the Violent Femmes. It's like, well, who are these guys? And, yeah. you know, and then I find out. Now, now I find this weird, by the way. Well, I'm not even going to get to my whole thing about um, the connection between the Violent Femmes and the Killers playing in the <laughs> arena that is on site where Dahmer's Chocolate Factory was in Milwaukee. We'll just lead that aside, right? Because we got yeah, better but, stuff to talk about. That. <laughs> we, we got better <laughs> stuff to talk about here. Um, listen, let's begin with this, and thanks for joining us. Um Tonight for the Horizon League Championship, you know, you've got a team that is red hot and has won six straight. And, you know, a lot like Oakland, I think, you didn't back down at the beginning of the season from playing like, you know, bigger conference schools, maybe taking some lumps and learning from it. What has allowed you to find this stability late in the year? Yeah, we played a, a really challenging schedule. Obviously, you know, some of uh, some some really tough high majors at one point we – I think we played in, uh, other than Hawaii, we played in all the time zones uh, in the, in the non-conference. Uh, and we we played two two of the teams we played that weren't high major uh, have already punched their ticket to, to the to the NCAA tournament. So those, those kind of games really do prepare you. Uh, and then we went through a, a bunch of injuries. Uh, we've had six surgeries at this point on this team. So a lot of perseverance for this group. Pr- pretty proud of, uh, you know, how we've, gotten through some some of that adversity and uh, ended up here in the championship game against uh, the great great Oakland Grizzlies. Coach, it took a number of haymakers last night to put away the defending champs in the north of northern Kentucky, 82-75 winners for you. How big last night and through this stretch has B.J. Freeman been? He has 22 of his 27 in the second half and ties a school record for consecutive 20-plus point performances. Yeah, he's been he's just been fantastic, and and uh, you know he was really rolling going into that game, and and uh, struggled uh, in the first half mightily. I mean, he couldn't make a shot. Could, you know, was turning the ball over. Was really down on himself. In fact, we were down fifteen. Uh, put him on the bench for the last you know three and a half minutes uh, of the first half, uh, and then you know kind of got himself together, and then ends up with whatever he had in the second half, twenty two, and and was just basically unstoppable you know down the stretch so uh really proud of bj um he's another guy that's been through uh was out for you know four and a half five weeks with a with a back injury broke a vertebrae in his in his back and and for him to do what he's doing now uh after that kind of injury really says a lot about him as a player and as, as a person coach i'm gonna i guess introduce a topic that we talked about just a couple of minutes ago about the horizon league and i find it you know, fascinating because college basketball is just constantly changing before our very eyes. I mean, we know this. And, and Coach Campy was just on with us a little bit ago, who you'll face tonight, of course, and you know well. And we were talking about the challenges at, at the Horizon League level with Transfer Portal and the realities of knowing that, you know, you might have some guys that you can get because they want to come back closer to home. Maybe they went away and they thought they they, they were greener pastors at a big school and now they, they've got a chance to come back home. But at the same time, you probably have some kids you're recruiting that are going to say to you, hey, look, you know, I, I'll play for you for a year, but I want to see if I got my chance in the Big Ten and that kind of thing. How do you navigate those realities and challenges? Yeah, boy, it's difficult. It, it, and you're right. It's like sand under your feet. Uh, you, you've got the, you know, I, I've always prided myself kind of as being a program builder. and But if you build it with young guys now and they get good, they, they're probably going to leave you, uh, which is your scenario. And then um, if you're getting guys that that uh, are older, which is more the trend, uh, are you really building a program or are you building successive teams? And uh, you know, which which again is 
you know, not the traditional college model anymore. You know, it's uh, it's not what it used to be. So it is challenging. You know, you look at Oakland and you look at, at our team and uh, Towson, who's player of the year, and B.J. Freeman, both of those guys could have jumped ship last year. And, uh, you, you know, it's mind-boggling, you know, the, the – the money that those guys were offered and those guys never hit the portal and they still were offered the money. So that's the landscape we're dealing with. So uh, I would want to play for Greg Campy. I'm very proud that BJ wanted to come stay here with us. Uh, and now you see the fruits of that uh, in this championship game. Now I've been told, and I want to know how much validity there is to this, that one of your better friends in coaching is Tulane head coach, former IUPY head coach, Ron Hunter, fact or fiction. Uh, no, I wouldn't say we're, we're good friends. I know Ron, but, uh, yeah, that's not, that's not part of my coaching tree. I don't know, uh, (laughs) where that, uh, but great guy, great coach. Okay. So, uh, and of course he spent time in, you know, what's now, you know, IEPY now in the horizon league. Um, and maybe that's where that, that came about. I don't know. I, I realize obviously not back in those days, but, um, in terms of Milwaukee itself, you know, in IEPY, in, in trying to get kids to come to the horizon, obviously they're looking for a new guy. What are the, cha- the, the, the things about, I guess not challenge, but the things about playing a conference tournament in Indy as opposed to on site that you like, or would you prefer to be playing conference tournament games actually on site, on campus, at your home? Uh, I, I would I would prefer it to be you know in a city uh, and I think Indy's an awesome place. The conference office has done an amazing job you know rallying the community behind the tournament, and uh, I, I, I think something of this magnitude should be played on a neutral site. Uh, you know there are some there are some advantages if you're a higher seed built into the tournament structure. Uh, you buy home seed in the quarter home home court in the quarterfinals, but when you get to the final four, I, I think it should be on a neutral site. So I'm I, I like the, the format that we have. Uh, and going back to your last question, you might you might have heard that uh, Josh Shirts at Indiana State was my assistant, and then ultimately my associate head coach um, at D2 Queens and then D1 High Point, and uh, he's with me for seven years. Pretty hey, pretty proud. Of coach let Shirt me tell you. How about the job that guy's done? I I think person. I'll give you the chance here to to vouch for it because I was saying it yesterday. I know that they were disappointed in the Moval final, but but coach, they should be in. I, I think they've stamped their. I think they've punched their ticket like you've got a chance to do tonight. But do you agree that the trees should be in the field? Yes, I mean it. It, it would be it would be a travesty if if they're not in and. Um, you know, who wouldn't want to see that team, the, the offensive firepower, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar on that, you know, <laughs> running the running the point for them. Uh, no, they're, they're, they're a great story, and that's what makes the NCAA tournament so special, our teams like Indiana State and stories like Coach Schertz, you know, who, who's grinded his way to that, to that point in his career. And, um, you know, if, if they pick a, a, a major conference team that's just uh, middle of the pack, you know, how exciting is that? Now, do you think, to... listen, in terms of the portal, I mean, Indiana State's reality has always been, you know, you, you got to look at, are people going to pluck that roster? And, and then, obviously, Coach Schertz as well, who's done a heck of a job there and put himself on the map. you think he stays in Terre Haute? Oh, I, I, I wouldn't want to speculate. <laughs> I wouldn't want to speculate. I think Terre Haute really likes Coach Schertz, and they'll probably do everything to keep him. And, uh, you know, Coach Schertz is, uh, is a guy that uh, – you know, if they've got a sushi restaurant there, he's and, and they take care of him. He's pretty happy. Uh, so I, I would say that uh, he does. I know that he does love Indiana, and, and he loves the support that the community has given his team, uh, which you know I've seen from afar, and it's been fantastic. Head coach of the Milwaukee Panthers, Bart Lundy, is our guest. The Panthers looking for their first Horizon League title in 10 years, and they take on Oakland tonight, 7 o'clock on ESPN. We had an opportunity, Coach, to talk to Coach Campy earlier. I want to get your perspective on this same question as well. You guys are the sixth seed in the final. The semifinals for the Horizon League featured top seed at Oakland, seventh seed at Cleveland State, fifth seed at the Norris defending champs of Northern Kentucky, and you guys the six at Milwaukee. How does that structure of having a one, a five, a six, and a seven in there representing a semifinal for the horizon speak to the depth of the league this year? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, once you got to the um, the top, really the top eight, any any of those teams could have been in this in this final four. 
Uh, and it's funny that the teams that did end up in the Final Four <clears throat> were the teams that were really the preseason picks. We were we were picked second. I think Northern Kentucky was picked to win it. Um, and, you know, Cleveland State was picked high as well uh, as Oakland. And, um, you know, all, all those teams uh, have gone through different adversities. You know, at one point we, we, we won a game at Cleveland State with, you know, seven players. And uh, so we've all gone through our, our different adversities. And uh, it's funny how it's played out. But, yeah, the, the, the top eight in our league, really, any of those teams could have ended up here. And we're fortunate to be playing really well at the right time. Lastly, Coach, this far into the season tonight when seeing a familiar team in the Horizon League Championship, again, 7 o'clock ESPN, Indiana Farmers Coliseum, great chance to go out and watch big-time college basketball for folks here locally. But is this about going out and just saying, you know what, we're just going to continue to do what we do at this point because we're both very familiar with one, with one another, or is it more about trying to limit what it is that Oakland wants to do? Yeah, I think it's part of both of those. You you don't want to get too far off your own script and uh and you know, dance dance with the one that brung you, you know, and uh but but at the same time you make adjustments. Um, you know, we've uh played two really tough games with Oakland, um, double overtime, the last one I think. And uh, you know, we've we've know how they've hurt us and how they've adjusted to what we did and now there is a little bit of a chess game going on, but Ultimately, it comes down to, to doing what your players have been doing since last summer and uh, and what they're good at. And you know, Coach Campy's gonna gonna make really good adjustments. But for me, I want my guys to go out there clutter free. You know, play the game. Uh, how many how many chances do you get to play in these championship games and go lay it all out on the line? See what happens. Coach Campy had said that it would be an Opus X cigar that he will enjoy back home if they were to win tonight. For you, Coach, I'm just going to recommend that you go to the best place, which is right off of the Paps Brewing, and get a cold Paps Blue Ribbon if Milwaukee wins. That's what I'll be doing next time I'm in Milwaukee. I I, I will do that or, or a high life. Um, you know, uh, it's got it's got to be cold. The the, the beer in uh, Milwaukee is very cold. So. <laughs> it's correct. Nobody, it doesn't sit in the glass long enough to go warm in Milwaukee, right? I mean, that's that's, that's right. Let's be that's honest, right? right? Yeah, we know what to, we know we know how to take care of those problems. <laughs> Coach, we appreciate it and enjoy your time in Indy and certainly best of luck tonight in the Horizon League Championship. Thanks, guys. Take right. care. Barbasol Horizon League Championships at the Indiana Farmers Coliseum. Seven o'clock tickets still available, of course, and the game is going to be on ESPN. Congratulations, by the way, to the Green Bay women who just secured their place in the NCAA women's tournament with a win. Tonight. All right, we got uh, one more coach to get to today, right? Paul Casaro going to join us next? He's going to join us at the top of the hour now. All right, now at the top of the hour, Paul Casaro from UND. They got a really good story brewing on, speaking of beer, brewing on the south side. We'll get to that. Say hello to the power, performance, and pres-
is always by Roll Down the Windows, Springtime has arrived song. One of them, right? No question about it. Pacers in action tonight, Oklahoma City. And in college basketball, Eddie, we should get back to this and rehash it. There are congratulations to be given to players in West Lafayette and the coach as well, correct? Oh, yeah, there's a ton for uh, West Lafayette. Um, let me pull up the tweet here that lists everything that they've got going on. But, like, uh, they pretty much it was the Purdue show when it comes to Big Ten Media Awards. Uh, so these are selected by the coaches. First team, all Big Ten, Braden Smith, Zach Eady. Um, that rounds out the Purdue mentions in that front. A co-coach of the year from Matt Painter with Fred Hoiberg of Nebraska. Uh, Mason Gillis was the sixth man of the year. Um, an honorable mention to Lance Jones and Mason Gillis for all Big Ten. Um, and then they had an assistant coach win, assistant coach of the year as well. And can't remember his name right now. Todd Meyer was saying, by the way, that this is the fifth time that Matt Painter has been named a Big Ten coach of the year. Again, co-coach of the year with Fred Hoiberg. Brandon that- Brantley. Oh, Brandon Brantley, the my class, 91, baby. Indiana High School All-Star. Yep. And been a big man assistant for Purdue for a number of years and is a huge part of the growth, for example, of Zach Eady. Um, but Painter now is second all-time in the Big Ten. He ties Bob Knight for second highest number of Big Ten Coach of the Year recipients. The man who leads that, I believe with seven, is his mentor and predecessor, Gene Cady. So pretty good company for Matt Painter. And obviously a great year. But again, for Purdue, the reality is, fair or not, the reality is that now is when it gets real for them. And, you know, the expectation is there and has been there that they were supposed to do these things. But now it becomes a matter of seeing what can be done for them in the postseason. And now is when it kind of gets real. And I think, but I just feel like this team is is equipped differently. They're just, they just, feel like they are equipped differently than others in terms of making a run. I think they're equipped to not have a stumble, but I, I, to your point, right? Like they are better equipped to not have that first or second round, that first weekend hiccup. That's not to say that if they get to the elite eight, when it's, you know, chips are down that they couldn't run into an equally impressive foe. They got to get past the first weekend is my point. And and like this team is equipped to do that. I mean, if you get, listen, if you get into the elite eight and you get beat by second seeded Tennessee, I, you know, that's pretty forgivable, right? I mean, the, the, the team that, that made the run and got beat on an incredible finish by Virginia, I, you know, that's, you let that happen. I mean, you you let that go. You go, well, I get it. it. You just don't, obviously for them, they don't want to lose to a 16. And then that second round game, I'm telling you, that's going to be the tough one. They're going to go up against some team with those eight nine games are always correct. tough. Always They're, a nine seed, you just you you don't want to go up against some nine seeded team that was not healthy for the first half of the year, and now everything's come together and they've won eight of nine and they're out of a big conference and they you know you just want to avoid that. But uh, we'll see what happens now for Purdue. Paul Casaro, by the way, a lot going on. You Indy, that conversation next. You've heard him on national radio. You've seen.
say. Question for you. I can't shorten Jake anymore to return the serve, so Jake, what's up? Ja. (laughs) Do you do you like Billy Joel? I do like Billy Joel. It's not Billy Joel, but Billy Jewel that UND has next, right? (laughs) Isn't that right? And if you're a UND fan, hopefully they're moving out after uh, that's nice. the matchup against the Greyhounds. Well played, right? Thank you. Yep. Well played. Um, as a matter of fact, Paul Casara, who is the head coach for UND, his number one seeded UND Greyhounds taking on William Jewell. That, of course, in the Division Two Midwest Regional. And Coach joins us now in the program. Coach, before we get to that, I was filling in, oh gosh, it was, I don't know, a month ago. You will know the exact date of Indiana Sports Talk for Coach Lovell, and we were going to have you on, and then all of a sudden they came in and said, uh, Coach can't come on. And I said, well, why not? What's he got that's so important? They said, well, he just had a – his wife just gave birth to their first child. I said, well, certainly that's excusable. So congratulations, man. Haven't gotten a chance to congratulate you in person on becoming a father. Congratulations. Thanks so much. And, yeah, you were the first one to report it. Um, that, that was awesome. It was uh, January 20th. We had a, a home game versus McKendry that day, which is – a a rivalry game when it was, uh, you know, we had about 2,500, 3,000 people at the game. And um, my wife calls me an hour before the game and says, Hey, I know I'm not due for a week, but they're going to start the induction process. She said, they don't think he's going to come till tonight. She said, coach your game. I'll see you when I see you. Your parents are picking me up right now. I said, are you, are you serious? She goes, yeah, do it. So uh, we won and I made it in time. She held off and it was a great, great night. And, um, yeah, it was awesome. You called about five minutes after he was born. <laughs> well, sorry about that. <laughs> that. That probably wasn't necessarily in the top of the pecking order of what you wanted to deal with in that moment, so I apologize. But uh, how has that been just in terms of, you know, perspective, I'm sure, life changes, but just in terms of the balancing acts, right, of now all of a sudden the new responsibility and the awesome responsibility that goes with that, but also you've got a heck of a basketball team to coach. It's been a whirlwind of a, of a of a winter, but it's been awesome. You know, uh, there's uh, you know people always say it, but you don't know until you actually go through it. There's nothing like being a dad, and there's nothing better. And then you know, I've got uh, I also got a family here at UND uh, with my team that you know I got a great group of guys, and they've been a lot of fun to coach. And we're doing something special, and it's it's cool to see you know your 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 home life be in such a good place as well as your work life too. And it's it's been an awesome an awesome basketball season. Coach Paul Casaro of UND Men's Basketball taking some time with us. Nickerson Hall hosts for the Midwest Regional, and they'll get started this Saturday. UND takes on William Jewell. Coach, that's a familiar foe for you guys this year. The Cardinals got the better end of you in two of those three matchups, including this past weekend in the GLVC semifinals. What did the tape say about that specific matchup, and what did you guys learn about your group as you prepare for them a second time? Well, you know, I I think we've – you know, learned what we kind of already knew about our group. Our group has a lot of fight. You know, we, we were down um, nine and maybe even as much as 11 and our guys came back and took the lead and uh, we played incredibly hard. Um, proud of our efforts. Um, just a few execution things down the stretch of the game that we need to be a little bit better at. You know, we watched the film on Sunday prior to selection show uh, to put that to bed so we could, you know, celebrate being the number one seed and then um, move on to just, you know, getting better in preparation uh, for this week. So, um, you know, it's the fourth time playing a team. You know, we, we, we lost to them by twice at their place. We beat them by twice at our place. We lost by four in overtime on a neutral site. So it's a, it, it's a pretty, pretty even matchup on paper. They, they've got a great coach and they got a good team and we do too. And I'm sure it'll be another great ball game this Saturday. Coach, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but this is now consecutive years. UND as a number one seed and as hosting at Nickerson Hall, correct? Yeah, that's consecutive, consecutive uh, back-to-back uh, GLVC regular season conference titles, consecutive number one seats. Uh, you know, both uh, – it's only the, the third uh, GLVC outright championship in UND history, and we've had back-to-back, and only the fourth time UND's had the number one seed um, in, the, in the regional, and we've had back-to-back too. So it's a special group of guys that have put, the, put, put back-to-back historic seasons together. What's the biggest difference between last year and this year's team? Well, I, I think you, we've been there. You know, like last year we had been the number, we were the number one seed, but it was the first time. Uh, I, I think experience um, is critical. I think the name of the game today in college basketball, as much as recruitment, is 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 retainment. And uh, we were fortunate enough to retain 
several guys that were really good players. Um, you know, they like being here. They all came back. And, you know, I think we're in a position to use our experience to our advantage. You know, when you talk about retain, you talk about, you know, just guys that are able to do things for you from a leadership standpoint. One of the things I love about your team, Coach, is you're led by a local guy. And look, you got guys from all over that have come to UND, and it's a great school. It's a cool arena. Why wouldn't you want to play there? But Jesse Bingham from Warren Central, who has now cracked the top 25 in school history and scoring, he leads you guys in scoring. He's a 1,000-point career scorer. Can you just elaborate on maybe his growth as a player and the maturation he has as a leader, as a local guy? Well, I think you hit it uh, with with the leadership. Jesse's always been the hardest worker, a lead by example guy since I got here. Uh, but every year he's involved evolved as more of a vocal leader. And you know, when Jesse talks, everyone listens. And uh, he's been you know really good about that this year. And also in, in the past, Jesse. I saw as great as he's been, he's been kind of the, you know, kind of take the game as it comes and, um, you know, let the game come to him. And we had a talk about midway through this season about, hey, no, I need you to take it to the game and coming out, trying to dominate out the gates. And our team, since that talk has been, you know, nine and two um, over the last 11 games. And that's no secret to seeing him just evolve with his confidence um, his leadership, but yeah, you know, everyone knows Jesse Bingham here in Indianapolis, and we do. We have guys from all over, but at the same time, we always like to to build in our backyard and get Indianapolis guys, and it's great to have a leader like him here. So if you're awake at 4.30 in the morning, is it more likely that that's because you're changing a diaper or watching film? That's watching film. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in season. I'm uh, in bed at, at, at 10.30 up at 3.30 or 4 every single day in season. And uh, my wife is a champ. She uh, She's let me know loud and clear that when season's over, it, it's your turn, buddy. So uh, uh, she's, uh, yeah. she, she's let me focus on the season with those late-night uh, baby calls right now. I was going to say, like, the season's over, and let's hope it's not for quite some time here, but 3.45 in the morning, you can't exactly say, like, I'm not used to being up. I, I, I can't do this. I can't do the bottle feeding, right? Right in it's rotation coming. for you. Yeah, my, 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 time, my time is coming. I know that. Paul Casaro, head coach of UND men's basketball. Nice enough to take some time with us. Paul, looking big pictures, you guys are also the, the host school for this region. This is great basketball opportunity for fans of the game to obviously come out and support the Hounds as they should on Saturday. But the bigger picture for UND, what's it mean to be a host site again? And what can fans of college basketball get to experience starting this weekend? Great basketball. I mean, you know, we're you know in in the basketball capital of the U.S., Indiana, in the in the capital city of of the basketball state. You know, and to be the University of Indianapolis and host the Division Two Midwest Regional, it's really special. We have seven other really good teams here. Uh, you can get a a ticket at a at a pretty good rate. And why wouldn't you come watch just awesome basketball over the course of especially the Saturday afternoon? You get four matchups Saturday. You get two on Sunday, and then you get the regional championship uh, Tuesday night. I think for any basketball fan, you're going to see real high-level play, uh, kids playing the right way, kids playing hard, and I think it'll be a really good environment. And I encourage all Indianapolis, uh, Indianapolis residents to come out and watch us. So since it's at home, this question may be not as applicable, but if you had to go on the road, um, you know, if you had not landed – the seed that you did and you had to go on the road and you guys do a bus trip is, are you required that it's a Greyhound bus? Is that part of the requirement of being you, Indy? It should be, shouldn't it? Maybe, that, maybe you're onto something with our, uh, with our sponsorships. Yeah. I mean, it seems, I would think the Greyhound folks would be all over that, right? Yeah, well, we do have a pretty darn good relationship with Free Enterprise Systems and, and uh, our, our, our driver, Greg Beaverson. He's as much as part of our program as anybody. So uh, we are with Free Enterprise. But, you know, in terms of a marketing standpoint, I can tell you uh, you guys do some marketing on your show. Or show I can tell uh, uh, Jake that, 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 uh, that you're, you're thinking the right way. <laughs> Jake, you'll just have Listen, to add it to the coach, long list of ideas you've had. That... Coach, now you see why I'm up at 3.30 in the morning, right? <laughs> I mean, this is the kind of stuff I just sit around and think about all the time, right? Um, My, mine's always going. You're always thinking. I'm, I'm trying to, at least. Coach, we wish you the best of luck. Uh, I guess in conclusion, it would be this. It, when you look at the totality of your season, if if there's one area that when you are up at 3.30 and you're watching film that you think to yourself, for us, for our guys to get where we want to go, the one area that I do Definitely want to make sure that we are minding our P's and Q's that has been our bugaboo this year, and I want to see it taken care of. 
and then I feel really good about things would be what for your team? Two things. It's what we build ourselves on. We have a talented team, and we're all about uh, winning the turnover battle and winning the rebounding battle. I'm a big believer that uh, you can't beat anybody else unless you can keep from beating yourself. That's the uh, definition of efficiency. And I think that we're good enough that if we rebound the ball and that we protect the ball, I think we're going to be in great shape. Ray Skillman, court at Nickerson Hall at 5 o'clock on Saturday. It will be William Jewell paying a visit to the University of Indianapolis in the NCAA Division II Midwest Regional and the Hounds have the home court advantage and hopefully will be able to parlay that and continue their way through the tournament and get a little revenge on William Jewell as well. Coach, again, congratulations, man, on the personal – victories and we certainly wish you the best in terms of the professional ones that are soon to come as well guys i always appreciate talking to you thank you appreciate it paul Cassaro, the head basketball coach at university of indianapolis you know it's interesting jimmy i think i've told you this and for you it's probably a little different because of the area of the city you grew up but for me my dad actually took classes at indiana central which became university of indianapolis but when i was a kid we did the science fair and history day both the regionals for that were always at Nickerson Hall, and that was my introduction to that university and that arena. But I think just growing up, the proximity of the school itself, and the same is true of Butler. When I started thinking about colleges, like those weren't two that were really on my radar because they were almost too close to home, right? And I think that was the case for a lot of kids. Athletics has been such a key part for both of those schools, for Butler and for UND, in building the profile and just making those two schools kind of household names here in the Indianapolis area, football and basketball, both for UND, really good programs. Yeah, it's carried the day for UND. And on the Butler side, as you mentioned, basketball puts them on the map. I will say, though, and this is from you know growing up on the south side, and I, I know that you know north side, east side, west side, west side kids, the story is probably the same, but connection for me to UND, connection for me for Butler – a lot of that was the summer basketball camps that both those yeah. campuses put on. It, 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 it's to still do it to this day. It's awesome to get to be in those historic venues, be around some great players, some great staffs, and the summer camps they put on in a state, as Paul mentioned, basketball capital of the world, baby. Like It doesn't get any better than that as a kid growing up in this city to get to go to a summer camp at two fine institutions like that, get to be at Nickerson Hall, get to be at – Hinkle Fieldhouse, it's great, and they're still incredibly well run to this day for those reasons, as you mentioned, because athletics paved the way for them to still be able to do things like that in the summer. By the way, we did not get to this earlier because we've been talking about the busy day in the NFL today in terms of agreements being met by players. For example, Derrick Henry agreeing to go to the Tennessee Titans. Yesterday's news, Gardner Minshew agreeing to sign with the Las Vegas Raiders, for the Indianapolis Colts, agreeing to terms with Tyquan Lewis. Zach Moss of the Colts agreeing to go to Cincinnati. Joe Mixon, formerly of the Bengals, agreeing to go to the Houston Texans. The Colts, of course, already, as we know, locking in an extension for Zaire Franklin, Michael Pittman Jr. Very close, it would seem, to inking a deal that would retain Rigoberto Sanchez. Those are the things that we were talking about. The fact that the Pacers are playing tonight – in Oklahoma City, the fact that Matt Painter has been named the co-Big Ten Coach of the Year along with Fred Hoiberg, and that puts him now second all-time in the Big Ten behind just Gene Cady, tying him with Bob Knight. We've talked about all of those things over the course of today, and Zach Eady being the Big Ten Player of the Year, if I didn't mention that. One of the things that we did not mention in all of that, with all of those tidbits we've been going over, Joe Lenardi, who I think one area where JMV and I differ – is I do put a lot of stock in Joe. I'm not saying JMV doesn't in Joe Lenardi's thing. I get the mock. JMV hates the nerds. We my, understand. Yeah, we get I, it. It's all right. And I'm 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 there as well. I mean, with the whole, I get so exhausted by like the 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 over analysis of metrics and stats. I get all that, but but I do think that Lenardi, more often than not, I mean, he usually has like of the 68 that are in, you go back and look at it, and he usually has like 66 correct. I mean, it's really close. He's been doing it for like 40 years. Like, he knows what he's doing. He also, I think, there are people on the committee probably that are giving him a general idea as to where things stand, right? Right now, and matchups I don't buy into, right? Because who knows in terms of the matchups of what he has. But in terms of seeding, he's usually very close. 
Joe Lenardi, in his latest bracketology, he has right now the last four buys. So teams that do not have to play their way in, he has as the Michigan State Spartans, Seton Hall, Texas Christian, better known as TCU, and Mississippi State. Those are the last four buys that he has. The first four teams he has missing the tournament, Texas A&M, Richard Pitino's New Mexico Lobos, Wake Forest, and out of the Big East, Villanova, followed by Pittsburgh, Iowa, Providence, and Memphis. Meaning, those are teams that you have to hope flame their way out early in their conference tournaments, notably Providence, Memphis, Iowa, Villanova. You don't want those teams getting hot and they still have the opportunity to prove their way in. The last four teams in, the last four in the tournament, the Buffaloes of Colorado, Virginia, who has played well in the last couple of months to put themselves in this position, Rick Bettino's St. John's group, and the very last that Joe Lenardi has right now, the team that will be anxiously watching and pulling for Texas A&M, New Mexico, Wake Forest, Villanova, Pitt, Iowa, Providence, and Memphis to not show themselves well in their respective conference tournaments. The last team in right now to the NCAA tournament, the Sycamores of Indiana State. So that's noteworthy for a couple of reasons. First, Jerry Palm doesn't have the the Sycamores in, and I've not checked Mike DeCourcy's last through, but I don't think he had them in either. Lenardi was the only one of the three major bracketologists. There's others, but of the three that are out there that had Indiana State in. The key wording Jake put there, the Sycamores are now the last team in the tournament. That is a flip from where he had them 24 hours ago, and none of the teams that they were ahead of played. That's notable because you're right about rooting against Texas A&M, New Mexico, Wake Forest, Villanova, et cetera. But you're also rooting against tonight, Colorado, Virginia, and St. John's, because those are three teams that, by his ranking, you were ahead of, and you were not the last team into the dance. Now you are, based on whatever wins change. This is a weird time of year. So you're not just rooting against first four out and next four out. Villanova plays, or not Villanova, excuse me, St. John's plays Seton Hall tonight. You're rooting for Seton Hall to win that game, because that would bounce St. John's likely out of the field. And Seton Hall, Seton Hall's already theoretically, is already in, right? Correct. They're, they're at the first four buys territory. When it comes to Virginia, you're rooting against them later in the week. When they get started in the ACC tournament, you're doing the same thing with Colorado. They get going tonight. They can go on Thursday, I beg your pardon, against Utah and Arizona State. St. John's matchup with Seton Hall is also Thursday. I misread it. The point is, though, this whole week, that's what it is. If you're an Indiana State fan, you were rooting against everybody that's ahead of you in that last four in category, and you're rooting against the first four out. Because if it's this razor thin at this stage, all it takes is one win from Villanova or one win from a Texas A&M to pretty much eliminate the trees from the big dance. Rooting for chalk. That's what you're rooting for if you're a tree. You're right. Well, it depends on the matchup, right? Because if it's a six versus eight, you're rooting for some type of upset there as long as it's a team that's either in or worse than well, you are. Well, but I mean, for the most part, one would assume that, to Eddie's point, a Memphis or a New Mexico – or a Villanova in the early rounds of their conference tournament, I guess you're right. I mean, if they're playing a seed that is slightly lower than they, but but you don't want them to even flirt you with You don't want big, any big runs from these people. Correct. Right. I'm not certain. I mean, in, it is entirely possible. Indiana State now has to sit back and watch, right? Correct. And it's entirely possible that a New Mexico or a Memphis, that that the gap between Indiana State and what those teams have done in the regular season is more than a one-game gap. It's possible that that they need, say, two wins or three to surpass Indiana State's resume. But you don't even want to – in other words, you look at, for example, if you were to simply look at Indiana State as being the last team in, okay, let's just say hypothetically this is gospel. And then you look at Texas A&M, New Mexico, and Wake Forest. Your your immediate brain tells you 
that Texas A&M, oh, well, if they win one game, they slide in front of Indiana State. It is entirely possible, though, that the committee is looking at it and saying, we have our 68, and the gap from 68 to 69 is much larger than the gap from 68 to 67. So for Texas A&M to move into the 68th spot, they need, let's say, two more wins or three more. You know, they don't have enough win- They don't have enough body of work. We don't know that, but that is entirely possible, that this is not like basically a tie and the Indiana State just barely is in front of them. I, I don't know that. That's what you have to hope for, though, right? Um, and you do not want – Villanova is the one also just based on – one thing that Jerry Palm and I got into a, a, a big debate about this on air once several years ago, and I, I will still maintain this. Now, I don't think it's applicable with any of the schools that we're looking at right here. But, for example, the year that he and I debated it, I remember it was Kentucky that was on the bubble. And Kentucky was on the bubble with Boise State. They were like the, the first two out. And I said then, and I still maintain it, and this is where I 1,000% agree with JMV, is the people that were like, well, you've never been in the mock selection committee where they train you on this kind of stuff so you don't know. And I'm like, you're right. I've not been one of the like overnight nerds that goes in there. And I'm telling you right now, <laughs> and I will maintain this. I will die on this hill, okay? Die on it. Kentucky, Kansas, North Carolina, probably Louisville. Those groups, for sure. Indiana used to be in this mix. I'm not sure that it still is. When Knight was coaching, Indiana was absolutely in this mix, okay? There are certain programs that their brand and their traveling contingency and their lightning rod, bigger-than-life coach, if it comes down to them and Boise State or them and, you know, insert name of – like a, a you know Wyoming, Nevada, whatever it might be. Can't believe you did your pokes like that. That's tough. And, but reality is reality. The tournament committee for years knew. No, they they love the brands, and they know this, Jimmy. How often did Syracuse sneak into the NCAA tournament over the last ten years? Right, because of that exact thing. And and, and this as well. Think about Indiana when Bob Knight was coaching. Okay, when Bob Knight was coaching Indiana, and the, people forget this. 93, Indiana was unbelievable. They were the best team in the country, right? And then we all know what happened. 94, they were still they were still good. They go to the Sweet 16. And then by like 96, things start to slide a little bit. All of a sudden, the recruiting, you know, Joby Wright is left and, and recruiting is 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 falling off and, and a lot's happening, right? In the last four or five years there, Indiana was kind of living off their laurels. And Indiana, if you look at those teams, where did they go in the first round of the tournament? They were sent to places like Boise or like Albuquerque or Buffalo because they knew they could send Indiana to an outpost and they would take 10,000 fans with them and sell their allotment and they could put them on either like at 1 o'clock in the afternoon or 11 o'clock at night, and because Bob Knight is on the sidelines and people don't know what he's going to do, it's going to get television numbers. And that absolutely catapulted Indiana, in my opinion, in years where maybe they weren't even, shouldn't even have been in. They got in off the bubble over a Boise State or a Wyoming because who in the world is going to go travel to see Boise State play? And I think the same holds true for Kentucky still to this day, Kansas to this now. Those teams have well played their way in. It's not applicable this year, right? But Villanova, Villanova might be is the that only yes. on that group yes. that, that has that reputation where that's the one that you want. You want Villanova and maybe Memphis nowhere even near it. Correct. Because reputation does come into play. It just does. I, I don't think that any of the, the true blue bloods I'm talking about, UCLA I wouldn't put in this category. And people are like, what are you, Jake, what are you talking about? They've won 11 national titles. You're crazy. Correct. But UCLA doesn't travel like Indiana, Kentucky, even Louisville. But I think today in modern college basketball, it's more, it's less about the travel aspect of it. But, as well, much, they, and they've changed the potting and all that. I get that. Right. But I, I mean, the brands matter. It does not matter if it's been 20 years since you've done something or 10. If there is a UCLA, an Indiana, a Villanova, a Syracuse, anybody at the doorstep between them 
and a five loss conference runner up at a mid major, it's going to the power school every time. Every time. And that's what Indiana State, regrettably, has had to deal with since Sunday because you had the opportunity to punch your ticket and now you're at the mercy of a committee that more often than not will favor the brand name. And to your point, Jake, Villanova is that. Villanova probably has the longest climb of the first four out as they're right on that seed line. But if they win two games and Colorado, Virginia, and St. John's hold serve, that's likely it for the Sycamores. Bart makes a good point. He said, Jake, you're right. That's why Izzo Spartans get in, but maybe haven't earned it. I, it's hard to argue with that. By the way, apparently I said, and I apologize, it was a Freudian slip, uh, Derrick Henry to the Ravens. I think I said Titans. Obviously, he's leaving the Titans and going to the Baltimore Ravens. Would we'll, uh, get you caught up on anything else that's happened in terms of comings and goings in the NFL in this legalized, I still think it's weird tampering, period. Anyway, we'll get to all that next. Are you dealing with foot, knee, hip?
died during the break. You had another heart attack over there? I did not, thank goodness. I'm on the good knee. Good. Daryl Strawberry just had a heart attack. Did you see that? Not good. No, I did not see that. Uh, he has recovered, thankfully. Um, and I don't know if that's the first. He's had, obviously, colon cancer in 1998. Uh, the baseball great, Daryl Strawberry, recovering from a heart attack. We're going to have upcoming, starting in the month of April, I'll be giving a lot of tips for you folks on how you can avoid, as I call it, Nolan Richardson's 40 minutes of hell in terms of a heart attack or other heart issues from Franciscan Health. We look forward to working with them to make sure that people are preventative and aware of their cardiac health hair. Uh, health care, I should say. Um, no, I somehow or another, I was tinkering around on my phone, and the song With or Without You by U2 came on, and both of you guys said you had not heard the song. Part of me died. I grabbed the artist. I, that's a win for me. If you know me, that's a win. Oh. Eddie, you've not heard the song? Nope. You've never heard With or Without You by U2? Nope. Okay. You ever, go to, the, you ever go to the dentist? <laughs> yes. Okay. What's that, Jimmy? Jake, in Is terms it because of- it's like pulling teeth? No, I think it would be, it'd be the type of song you could hear when you're at the Just like in, overhead the, anywhere. Overhead, like you go yeah. anywhere in the world and you, you, know, you hear it overhead. Jake, right? you should add this. This is just a free little tip. I understand that uh, you have me by a number of years, but just for a free tip for April for your heart list, mm-hmm. if your heart health is going to be reliant on myself and Eddie to pick you up for old movies or old music, you're going to be... <laughs> that's why I'm on the good Jake, meds, what happened? Jim. what happened Jimmy, at 234? that's why I'm on the good medication. That's right. <laughs> What happened at 234 on March 12th? I, There's a spike in your blood pressure here. <laughs> that's, that's exactly correct. That's okay. I mean, hey, listen, it, 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 you guys keep me young. Um, last night, speaking of young, young players in the NBA, and I, this is one area where I will admit that I was wrong, although I do maintain that I think Trace Jackson Davis is obviously a guy that had a – and I think we're learning now just how valuable he was for Indiana in his college years. and. You know, there was a lot of discussion about what he could or could not be at the NBA level. I think that he went into the perfect situation. And, you know, there was a lot of grief that the Pacers caught for passing on him. I remember interviewing Chad Buchanan, and Buchanan said that the the camp for Trace Jackson Davis basically, you know, in the discussions had said that they would prefer that the Pacers not draft him because I think he didn't want to be a two-way, two-way player and – felt situationally like there were better opportunities for him. Clearly, Golden State has been a very good opportunity. He has taken advantage of that. And last night in the NBA, Trace Jackson Davis with the dunk heard around the world. Here we go. One more bucket. One more bucket or one more stop. Trace Jackson Davis. Oh! He put the entire country of France in the basket. Take that eight-foot wings, man, with you. (laughs) That is his welcome to the league moment. That dunk coming over the number one selection in the NBA draft last year, Victor Wembanyama. as – now, I'm going to be nitpicky here. It was an unbelievable play, and Jackson Davis has played really well. That audio, courtesy of NBC Sports Bay Area that had that call, it was kind of more of a long side Wembanyama dunk as opposed to like – I think of a posterized dunk meaning like – the dude is right in front of you, and you literally kind of jump over him, right. like Vince Carter. Vince Carter, Carter right. yes, yes. Uh, you know, that's but the nonetheless, top one that I comes mean, when you've got a guy with that, you know, Webham Yama is. You talked about it, Jimmy, when when the Pacers were playing San Antonio. I mean, his close range, you know, he could be at the three point line defensively, and somebody gets free on the opposite baseline or whatever. I mean, Webham Yama's ability to close in to block a shot just based on his wingspan alone. It doesn't really matter if you're in proximity of him yeah. and you're getting a dunk. It, it then that that is allowed to be called a post. No, it's an right? incredible highlight play. Your point about his closing speed, unless you have like Steph Curry release range in terms of quickness on the catch and shoot, like you're asking for trouble unless you're very very confident you can hit the shot over him. He's got incredible length. They highlight the wingspan on that call, and if even, even if it is post or adjacent, it's still a pretty cool moment. For Trace Jackson Davis, he's taken advantage of the minutes increase that he's gotten this month. He's had five games so far, six games, I beg your pardon, so far this month, where his minutes have increased to 16 minutes or greater. He scored in double figures in three of those six contests. About that clip itself, this isn't useful for the radio audience 
or our YouTube audience since it was just an audio clip. But if you get a chance after the show, go back and look at this from the Warriors bench. Oh. Collegiately, you get those like crazy hand on head, fake feigning all the time during March Madness. It takes very big moments in the regular season for it to warrant that type of childhood giddiness that that dunk elicited from the Warriors bench last night. And those are some of my favorite non on court, but kind of off court reactions to plays that you get so often during March. Very rare. You get at the NBA Warriors bench, having a great time for trace Jackson Davis. That slam. Now, somebody said, Jake, does it really make you feel that old that someone has not heard with or without you by you two? Eddie, you've heard the song, right? I've definitely heard it. I just couldn't identify it. I Hold on, let me Eddie. pull it up and play it in to myself over uh, here. Well, just play it on the air. People want to hear it. It's a it's a fabulous tune. I, I'm assuming when you hear it. Fortunately, I cannot do that. What do you mean? <laughs> Can't do that. Copyright stuff with YouTube. Yeah, but but okay. I guess in that portion, I mean, we're doing a radio show, not a, not a YouTube show If you show got in se. and out in like five seconds, it'd probably be fine. But I understand Eddie's, this is a... This is behind the curtain. I mean, can you mute the YouTube audio temporarily for what's going out over the radio? I well, I can, but it's it's work. The break rooms they're they're hard at work, I, Jake. They're 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 there night in the I, day. I get and- it. I understand, and I re- and I appreciate people on the YouTube chat that are most of the time having and Facebook, good civil and conversation. Twitter, yeah. Okay. So are you playing it to yourself then? Do you want me to just sing along and and we'll pretend people at home can <laughs> pretend that we're playing it? And you give I'm 20 seconds yourself in. away. 20 seconds with in and nothing. Without you. It's just music right now. All right, here we go. Without you. Oh. And you, okay, we're waiting for the verdict. This is scintillating here. Yeah, this doesn't ring a bell. I've heard it before. I'm just terrible at, at naming songs. Unless it's an artist I really, really love. Like the moving out pull for Billy Joel. Yeah, yeah I got you. No problem. Okay. Uptown Girl. You know Uptown Girl, yeah, right? Of course. Okay. Yep. We didn't piano start the man? fire, Piano Man. Yeah, okay. Yeah. How about Where the Streets Have No Name, Eddie? Vienna. Okay, Pride, In the Name of Love. Yes, that's the only one I know. Okay. Vertigo is, I think, my favorite U2 song. It's probably also their most mainstream song of Correct. a lot. Correct. Kind of a mainstream guy with music, again, unless it's an artist that I really love. Now, you can't play the YouTube instrumental, right? It has to be because that's the same thing, right? It, it, that would be a regardless of what he's playing, he needs to get in and out in like five or seven seconds at most. Otherwise, YouTube's very they're very stringent. About I'm not going to take the bait on that easy joke. Now, am I? <laughs> you know, uh, NFL news. Nothing new from the Colts today. The the latest when we came on the air, and I have not seen anything to cement or finalize this particular storyline was that Rigoberto Sanchez was close to coming to a deal with Indianapolis. Eddie, you are nodding that it appears as though that is still the case, correct? Uh, Three years, seven and a half million, I believe, was the number. Not that the Colts were going to be necessarily in the market in this area, but another notable signing that's happened since we've been on the air today. Uh, Ravens star linebacker Patrick Queen signs with the Steelers. So you're seeing more movement, but Jake, our conversation earlier with Stephen Holder, and again, you get that, Wherever you get your podcast, you can get on 1075thefan.com or just search Query and Company, wherever you get your podcast. But the real noise for the Colts or the noise that turns into acquisitions is tomorrow once it becomes the true wild, wild west. Because, yes, it is the legal tampering period, but there is still advantage serve to the teams that hold the players up until tomorrow because they still hold that last bit of leverage of trying to retain them. It's why so many teams like the Colts went on a shopping spree to retain so many players in the last 48 hours because once you hit the open market, the safeguards are off. It's over. You have no shot of retaining unless you're going to get into a bidding war. That's where I think you're finally going to see if there are a big swing or two acquisition from the Colts starting tomorrow. What about Wild Wild West by Kumo D? You know that one? How about Wild Wild West by Will Smith? (laughs) I know yeah, that okay, one. that one, yeah. <laughs> Do you know why Wild West? I bet you know it by Kumo D. I used to live downtown, 129th Street, Convict. You know that one? The Wild Wild West. Yep. The Wild Wild West. Yeah, okay, I didn't yeah. know that's who so it I was. Bet that's yeah, yeah. So that's sampled off of Will Smith because so, right? that, that Wild Wild West, that's in there. So okay. I would assume that's sampled. Yeah, I mean, I, the Kumo D version in, in your defense is probably, well, it actually probably isn't that much older than With both. or Without I've You, but With both. or Without You just to me is is like a, 
you just hear it like, you know, you're in the grocery store, it plays overhead type thing, right? Um, but at any rate, the other thing that I wanted to ask you guys about from an NFL standpoint, because we touched on it earlier, and that is Derrick Henry signing with Baltimore and going out of the division. Now you have Joe Mixon coming into the AFC South trade. That's a tough with Houston. <laughs> I, here's the thing with, with Derrick Henry. I, I think the world of Derrick Henry's talent, I just think that he is a game-changing, clock-salting back, but he was that in college and professionally. I guess the question is, is it that big a save getting him out of the division, or is that fuel? Is that tank on empty? It doesn't matter regarding Derrick Henry that he's gone. Why it's not a significant move for the Colts, and some people push back on this because, oh, the Titans are this animal and they're always a pain in the butt to play. That's true, but two of the biggest reasons why they were pains in the butts to play are now gone. Mike Vrabel's gone. Derrick Henry, gone. Had that been a loss for, like, Houston because they're further along in the division and the Colts are chasing that, right? that's more significant for me. It's actually more scary, the trade-off of Derrick Henry being out of a – Middling Tennessee is insignificant because of the fact that now Joe Mixon is headed to Houston, think, a team that's on the same plane I think as the Mixon's Colts. Mixon's kind of at the end as well. He, I, you know Tony I mean? Pollard also going to Tennessee, yeah, to he, replace Henry. Yeah. Just he very FYI. well, he very well might. I'm not against you on that. Like Mixon is towards the latter half of the running back stage, but to have a back like that, he is still high level serviceable. The fact that he's now in Houston. That, that's that's something to look funny, at from the Colts' perspective. We talked so much about the devalue of the running back, and now here's the storyline of the AFC South so far. I mean, a long way to go. It well, is, because you know, running back movement. It's the life you want to live as a general manager, and the Texans have the ability to do that this offseason. We've talked about it how many times now. The Colts are in the same boat. They just don't have – they should internally because it's the guy they drafted. They don't have the same definitive answers the Texans do. By that, I mean there's no doubt in Houston's mind going into this offseason, C.J. Stroud's the dude, and he's making, what, less than a million dollars on his rookie contract going into this year? They have that luxury of being able to play, and I might be off by that by a little bit here or there, but you get the point. He's on a rookie deal. They have the ability to splurge and take big swings to catapult themselves into this is now not just an AFC South window, this is a championship window for Houston. Are there games for which you've decided you're going to splurge and take a big swing tonight, Jimmy? <laughs> of course. Of All course. Right, we'll are. find out what they are next. Want to cut cooling bills without cutting comfort?
Cook plays of the day. This is me, all right? I'm not a athlete. This is my way. This is how I win. Today's plays of the day is conference championship week rolls on. We'll start first in the big sky. Take Idaho State. Scoop the seven. They take on Montana in the semifinals of the Big Sky Conference Tournament in Boise, Idaho. Another semifinal. Make that a first-round matchup. I beg your pardon. We'll take the Billikens of St. Louis over Rhode Island. First-round action of the A-10 tournament in Brooklyn, New York. These all are conference tournament finals. Scoop the four. Milwaukee four-point dogs tonight at the Coliseum. Over at the Indiana State Fairgrounds, taking on Oakland. So scoop the four at Fort Milwaukee. Another final CAA Conference Tournament final will scoop the 10 on Stony Brook as they take on Charleston hey, you stole my out in D.C. Last what about, one what for- about Fulton and Creston <laughs> along with Stony Brook? Last one for you. West I will, Lane. We'll take Gonzaga on the money line against St. Mary's in the West Coast Conference Tournament final what about Clay? out in Las Vegas. What's Clay going to do against Stony Brook? Stony Brook's been on a roll, man. The Seawolves. Been on a journey all the way to get to the conference final. You know, Stony Brook is playing Charleston. Charleston had a guy that coached him named John Cress. I always thought was the most underrated coach in college basketball history. He won like 84% of his games. Eddie, do you have anything, by the way? Negative. Okay, all right. John? Let me just, uh... Is it cool the Colts are going team run it back again right now? Pretty Considering much that's happening. been John, they the keep, whole path? They, they take care of their own, and then they go out. At some point, don't you have to have results with team run it back? No. I, I'm not listen, I don't know if there's anybody that's I mean, like a difference maker out there, but it does seem like a very similar path. I like Zaire Franklin, Michael Pittman Jr. I'd like to see Kenny Moore back here as well. I'm assuming at some point, maybe today, tomorrow we find that out, right? But I mean, is this all going to work in terms of finding the results that everybody's been looking for? Chime in, well, please. I, I think freely. It, ha- it has to be Followed up by a hammer of signings tomorrow when it officially really a opens up. Hammer of signings because other be. because was I'm with you. You're doing the definition of insanity, right? Repeating the same thing over I and just, over again yeah, by I'm just, I'm I'm if the guy if the guy making those decisions is allowed to continue to run it back every year, then what motivation is there to do anything other than run well, it back? Well, it's every weird year? because I think the guy that coaches the team, I, I kind of wonder if they have at times differing philosophies about right. what makes a team good. And yeah, considering one's in year number two and the other's going to go in year number eight. Yeah, I mean, I, but... The only one they couldn't afford to walk would be right? my guts, I would too, so yeah. The only one I could not afford for them to have walk was Michael Pittman Jr. They took care of that. The rest, yeah, whatever. Grover Stewart's a solid player. You retain yeah. Zaire Franklin. I, you know, I shouldn't have a gripe. But by the way, Greg Campy's awesome. I can listen to Greg Campy all great, day man. long. It's great. All day long, man. Just like, on every level of basketball. I like when I said, you know, hey, is there an optimism about, like, all the, the chaos at the big levels in, in a smaller conference like your own might have more stability? And he's like, no, that is way too optimistic <laughs> and not realistic at all. I'm like, okay, cool. I just love it. He said, our leading scorer and the best player on our team will be in the transfer portal right after <laughs> our final game. Goes, and I know that. I got two choices. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay. He's like, yeah, <laughs> hey, I can't pay him 150 grand. <laughs> That's great. And, yeah. I love basketball, but college bat they this stuff makes it it makes it tough. Hey, man. listen, I mean, one I, of my I, I want to watch this. I'll watch the NBA. One of my you know? dear friends went to high went to homecoming with her twice in high school. Uh, her son plays for Dartmouth, mm-hmm. and he's a he's a freshman at Dartmouth, and you know they just unionized. And oh the, yeah, and and she told me she's like, yeah, they're probably gonna be the first of many, right? So if he Let's doesn't see. have a good game, will he get cut? Yeah, that's a good question. Might get fired. Well, he's got the union on his side, yeah. right? I guess, I yeah. Means. The unionized. Yeah. All right, what do you got up next, John? We got Josh Schertz, who's going to make his pitch to the committee here in town about why they should be in. Jerry Palm will tell us probably why they shouldn't be in. And uh, who else we got here, James? Uh, Noah Eagle. Uh, Peacock is doing those Big Ten games, too. The first couple of Big Ten games. Noah. We had Ian yesterday, the dad, the son, Noah, today. Nice. All Very right. Nice. And you'll talk about Trace Jackson Davis post Oh, that around. was great, wasn't it? That's I love good. everybody out there that called him soft. All these so-called basketball experts. So many IU people called him soft. Yeah, shove it right up your rear end. Seriously, there's your soft. All right, fair enough. John's up next, and we'll be back with you tomorrow at noon. Crime and violence in Indy. Chaos at our border. 